This is a long-form video about the Zcam E2C Cinema Camera, which works out to be about all of the E2 cameras with similar features. It's a full menu guide to every single feature of the product, some video samples I shot in the field, rigging advice, and some review comments along the way. Cinematographers have started taking note of a new Chinese wave of manufacturers led by Zcam and their E2 lineup of cinema cameras. The E2C implies that it's not only more compact than the E2, but also more affordable because the E2 costs $2,000 and with just a few less features, the E2C is under $800. Let's get more acquainted with the product by taking a deep dive into some of its features, focusing first on the ports on the back panel of this ultra-compact product. When it comes to power options, besides the LPE6 Canon battery, there is a power port on the bottom right. On the left, an Ethernet port for remote control and live streaming in a network. There's a USB-C port for docking a solid-state drive, and then an HDMI output at the top. On one of the side panels behind a flap, there's a 1 8 inch stereo headphone output, and right beneath that, a 1 8 inch stereo input for an external microphone. On the other side behind a flap, an SD card slot. If you use an SD card, it won't even take the higher bit rate possible on a UHS-2 card. It's just a standard SD card. The sensor is micro four thirds, which is fairly light sensitive compared to the longer history of digital sensors but it's still pretty small in comparison to what we're becoming accustomed to these days. On this chart, you can see where we fit in compared to full frame and even larger. It's even smaller than Super 35. Then again, this Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K is around micro four thirds size, but that camera has dual ISO, which has a little bit more light sensitivity, and this camera lacks that. So then the next question is how it performs at nighttime. You're actually hearing this audio from the internal microphones of the camera itself, which is performing all right after a recent firmware update. But when it comes to how we're doing in this low light environment, another feature was added in a prior firmware update, and it's basically a sort of recording mode called low noise. And noise reduction is something that every sensor does to a certain extent when it's not raw anyways. But Zcam is really found a delicate balance between um, compromising the codec and really cleaning up the image essentially. And so if we zoom in really tight, you'll see that the grain and the digital noise is actually not so bad. It's an H.265 compression when you record internally to the SD card to be able to have a reasonable bit rate and small file sizes. And that H.265 format is also a pretty good compromise given the limitations of the sensor itself. I didn't see any incentive to go to ProRes and I have my own misgivings about that format to begin with. A distinguishing feature of the older and more expensive E2 is its capability to record at 160 frames per second in full 4K. The E2C can only do 60 frames per second at 1080p, so this is a sample at half speed in that mode. We're still shooting at night, but we're moving along to artificial light sources and also moving indoors where things get a little more complicated that way. We've been roaming around Chinatown in D.C., but now we're inside the Kennedy Center. I haven't mentioned that I'm shooting in the Z-Log2 mode, which is Zcam's own log format. And so the challenge is to get the white balance right. When I go into the Metro Rail Station, it becomes especially challenging because of the many different types of light sources, and so I found Z-Log2 a little wonky compared to other log formats. But what we're really going to do down here is we're going to check out rolling shutter performance, and many will call this a deal breaker. You'll see the freeze frame, that it's just the sensor readout is very slow. It really just limits my choices on how I'm going to use the camera, and I don't mind it actually myself, but it's something to be aware of. Moving along to daytime color temperature, I'm seeing how I can manage white balance in this environment along with highlight roll off and the challenges of bright sunlight. And um, it feels like a work in progress. But one thing I haven't mentioned is that as the caption indicates, I've been using Film Convert Nitrates Z Log 2 LUT. But I'm flipping over right now to Z Log's own color plugin for Premiere, and it seems to perform better, but I still have more testing to do. 
So now that we've run the Zcam E2C through some tests in the field, we're settling down now to take a deep dive through the menus, going through every single menu option, and then using that as an occasion to present a sort of tutorial, and perhaps some tips on how you might use this product in your own creations. And then also, along the way, make a few review points about how great the product is, how it compares to other cameras, and maybe some tips on how firmware could improve a few functions here and there. First, let me explain the setup, which is that I'm actually feeding the HDMI output of the camera to an Atomos Shogun, but it's recording in full 4K UHD resolution. And then what's nice about this is that I currently have activated an overlay function where the HDMI output of the camera can feed us the on-screen menus. So in reality, this little box at the top left of the screen is a grid of nine boxes that is exactly the same grid that you see when you press the far left rubber menu button on the top of the modular camera inside the little square window. So it's really the same thing as you sitting in front of the camera and going through the functions yourself. And the good thing is we can see that on screen, but we can also see it overlaid on the video that we're actually shooting live with the camera with my narration and sync. So here we go. But before we dig into the first menu option record that's currently highlighted, I'll again mention that there are those top buttons and those top buttons essentially are using cursors that move up and down and then an okay button on the far right. And finally a function button when necessary, which when you're digging through the menus, you'll hardly use. So really it comes down to the menu button to go into the menus themselves, but then once you go into an item to press the menu button to sort of exit or go back one step. So here I am at record. Just to show you how it works though, I can navigate to other features by pressing the down button. And of course it cycles back to the top. But I'm gonna go ahead and press okay on this record section. And then we'll see that we're presented with a list there are some great things about how this works because it's really logically designed and laid out, but unfortunately you'll never be able to know for sure, absent some sort of scroll bar on the right or left, how long this, the list goes. So that's a bit of a problem, but you do find out how long it goes because when you get to the end, you bounce right back up to the beginning again. So this one is a somewhat longer list than some of the other boxes, but in the record menu, um, let's start with resolution and just press OK to go into that further submenu. And already right at the top, you'll see the selection I made. And it is an abbreviation that after time, you'll start to recognize these terms. It's not standard to use C4K as an abbreviation, but what that means is Cinema 4K. And Cinema 4K means actually in reality true 4K because Ultra HD is the honest way that actually most so-called 4K TV sets present what we have now called 4K video because it truly reaches 4,096 pixels across the screen. Um, cinema 4K is that exact standard of going past 4,000, but in reality, if we go down to so-called just 4K, what that actually means is 3,840 pixels across, but what's in common between these two modes of cinema 4K and regular 4K is that it actually they have the same vertical number of pixels, which is 2160. So uh, already off the bat, I guess they could have used different terms. I would have just gone with maybe C4K or just 4K. And then right down here, it really is technically UHD. It's not true 4K after all. But let's set that aside and focus on the really interesting thing here, which is this parenthetical that says low, low noise. So it's not like we'll really be able to tell a difference here given the decent lighting that we have. But if you just go to Cinema 4K, and here we are in the new mode. So what's different about this mode? Well, the answer is it doesn't apply any low noise sort of sensor processing. And it's hard to describe, and it's definitely above my pay grade and knowledge. But I think what the engineers would do a better job than me of describing is that basically any sensor in the universe applies some sort of noise reduction in its debayering process when it converts raw sensor data 
into something that um, looks good, to put it simply. That's why actually on my Blackmagic cinema camera, when I put it in B-RAW mode, the noise levels actually look a little worse, even though, worse than I should say ProRes, even though RAW should best ProRes in terms of being true RAW capture or nearly true RAW capture. So there's an irony already in the sense that noise is something that simply, in most cases, quite honestly, should be reduced. I would do well to sort of skip these other uh, modes of no low noise and just go with the ones that have the parenthetical low noise. And if you note the aspect ratio of this image, but what's going to be recorded will have just a different crop factor. So the crop factor for UHD is true 16 by 9 whereas the crop factor of cinema 4K is actually 1.85 to 1. So moving down the list, we've already talked about cinema 4K and 4K with the low noise parenthetical as an alternative. And that's interesting too, isn't it? That it reveals a little bit more on the bottom. So this is giving us a clue into the true, um, how do I say, surface area of the sensor where there's a bit more information at the bottom there, isn't there? That's kind of interesting. So I hate to use the cliche or cite the cliche, but one of the reasons people want, would want to shoot in a square aspect ratio these days, you guessed it, Instagram. But there could be other reasons too, and we might get to them. But I'm moving further down the list, and sure enough, we can go back to the 16 by 9 aspect, ra aspect ratio of 1920 by 1080 for the simple reason that there is no, so to speak, slow motion, that is over cranking or high frame rates on this camera, but for in the 1920 by 1080 mode. So whereas on a Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K, you have the ability to shoot in full cinema 4K at 60 frames per second. And then of course on that camera, when you go to 1920 by 1080, you can go to a whopping 120 frames per second. On this camera, by going to 1920 by 1080, we'll actually be able to go up to 60 frames per second for a medium, performance of uh, slow motion. So uh, that is the reason why we would go there. Or if you just want smaller file sizes, or if you know your target resolution is never going to push the boundaries of 4K anyways, and you're satisfied with 1920 by 1080, you can also just use 30 frames per second or even just 24. So when I pushed down, it brought me back to the top of the menu, and I'm good. A comment, by the way, that goes more to the setup that we're working with here is, I did kind of have everything set to my favorites um, after having you know, done my own deep dive through the menus. So we're always gonna be starting with sort of my preferred um, settings that I have the camera at, uh, which can be saved into a profile, which we'll see later. But then I'll also defend my choices and see what you think. So I press the menu button to go backwards one step, and now we're down to the second menu item within the record subcategory, and sure enough, project FPS or frames per second, I press OK, and I have my standard 29.97 frames per second selected, and that's where I live, actually. I'm definitely not in the camp of, uh, I don't know, stuttering, flickering video that's supposed to look more cinematic. I think I've harped about that on my Blackmagic tutorials, too. So much uh, debate, but that's where I am. Um, but you can go down. So in PAL territories, such as Europe, a lot of people use 25 frames per second as sort of the equivalent um, in Europe to the uh, frame rate we use. So there's the 25 option. There's the pure 24 frames per second option, which is when you're truly shooting in a sort of film style. But most people who actually do that will go to 23.98. Definitely not something to bore you with here, but it's interesting when you look into the difference because it's slight. But the reason why people would choose 23.98 instead of 24 has to do with the ultimate deployment that you might use for your media onto actually like the case that you're looking at here, a DVD or Blu-ray where you need to have it be basically a multiple of those decimal numbers to be compatible in, in the best way with the ultimate output. Okay, enough on that. So you can see, however, that the 50 frames per second is ghosted out. I'm pressing the OK button right now, but it's just not letting me go there. Um, same for 59.94. And once again, the reason is that if I were in the 1080p mode, press menu to go backwards, 
go down to the frames per second, suddenly now 50 and 59.94 are revealed. So there's that. I'm going to go back again, get us back to 4K. So we've gone through all the frames per second. We're going to the third one. And this is a really trivial decision you have to make because it really truly won't affect um, the performance of the camera nor the file because what you can choose between is just simply the container. And there's no difference between .mov and .mp4 in terms of the container, but I will give you this tip. Because of the fact that QuickTime is mostly extinct on all Windows computers, there's really no incentive to save into the MOV container. What really is going to matter is what codec we use and the bitrate and so on. So um, when I'm on a Windows computer, if I have a bunch of MOV files, then Windows Explorer simply won't show me preview thumbnails of any of the files that I um, shoot from this camera. Again, that's if it's in .mov, which requires the QuickTime um, player and engine installed on a Windows PC. And these days we don't do that anymore, so we want to stay with MP4. So good enough. Okay. So again, we're in the record menu. The third item down was that container choice. And this is pretty interesting, and I kind of like this. Um, this might have gotten around what has long dogged video makers and a great example of overregulation uh, with regard to taxes and international borders. In a nutshell, there's more reasons than just that why there's this so called split duration, but for many years, although I think it's retiring, I heard. Um, you could only save files that could last as long as, but no more than 30 minutes. Otherwise, it would be categorized for tariff and tax reasons as a pro camera. And so consumer electronics manufacturers have avoided that curse by breaking up files into smaller duration. So for example, my GH4, one of the things I always loved about it was that it actually created little tiny chunks, like 10 minutes each, but it could go on forever. Uh, most other cameras these days, though, continue to, you know, stop at 30 minutes. And in fact, it can cause you problems. I've had some really disrupted shoots because during an interview after 30 minutes, I lost everything that was spoken after 30 minutes. So there's another benefit to breaking files into smaller pieces, though. Um, in the old days, it was because of the uh, file format that we were saving into um, when, we're, when it comes to the um, file system, because they could only hold files of a certain size. With XFAT, which is the format that we want to save onto um, in this camera, XFAT uh, gives us plenty of room for very long files. So that's not a problem. But some people like breaking par files apart into smaller pieces. And you can see the wisdom if you're using these small Canon batteries because um, you don't want to have a corrupted file that's two hours long or something. So anyways... I chose 30 minutes because nonetheless, I still want the trade-off between the ability to um, safeguard myself against power failure or whatever else and to not have corrupted files, but to let it run and to not run into a situation where it'll automatically stop recording just because it reached that set amount. So 30 is my compromise, but actually as this is going to happen in a couple of days when I'm in Philly, I'm going to record um, classical music. And so then it needs to run for as long as I can let it run. And in this case, my longest that I can let it run is 60 minutes. So I'm actually going to leave it there, get ready for Wednesday. So that's what that's all about. Of really no importance when it comes to the quality of whatever you shoot this, uh, whatever you uh, shoot with this camera, but it's a conscious decision you should make um, balancing you know, breaking your image, your, your footage apart into smaller chunks for safety reasons um, versus not running into that pickle of, oh no, it stopped recording and I didn't want it to. I'm pressing the menu button again to go back one step. So we're down to the fifth item on the list, which is something I'm just not passionate about. Some of you are. Um, time code is outdated in my mind for most even professional users, the reason being that audio analysis of multi-cam shoots is more than sufficient for syncing up cameras, given that it's built into Premiere and other nonlinear editing programs, and you can even use Red Giants uh, pluralized to do this sort of thing. So I'm kind of honestly flaking out and skipping through a lot of this, um, but suffice to say, you can see the various ways that you can set timecode. You can have different devices mate with each other for timecode purposes. Um, you can key it to the HDMI displays 
own EDID or other sort of metadata information for sync purposes, and it cycles back to the beginning. So right now it has ghosted out even the choice to choose the source because of the fact that it's not seeing, or as it, as it happens in this case, it's not hearing via an audio jack any time code. This is not a sophisticated uh, time code feature on this camera compared to other more professional cameras, but we are talking about an entry level cinema camera here. So I just don't think that a lot of you are going to be deploying or using time code with this camera, but it's nice to see it's available anyway. So I'm pressing menu to go back one step. And so when I press down from here, there's still more to see in the list and we have playback frame rate. So that is rather like on the Blackmagic 4K. It's something that can confuse a lot of people sometimes. When it says default, what that really means is I'm going to maybe over crank or not, but whatever the case, I'm going to put it into the sort of standard uh, frame rate that I chose and have it play back at that same over crank speed. But I could also set it to sort of burn the file into a different custom frame rate, VFR variable frame rate. So this is really all about making a decision sort of at the settings level about whether the content that you're filming is going to be in slow or fast motion. However, all serious creators in my mind know the secret, if you will, that you kind of always want to have it on default and simply take over cranking and save any of these, any of these decisions for post-production. There is no good argument if you're over cranking. Let's say I'm shooting, of course, max on this camera is 60 frames per second or 59.94. I would rather just take that true overcranked um, file with all of those extra frames to deal with and then proceed in post-production to go ahead and turn it into slow motion, for example. So I would personally recommend that you just leave it on default at all times for this menu item called playback frame rate. So I'm pressing down and then we still have one more thing at the bottom of the list of record. And when I press okay, you'll see that it's simply asking for me to identify the camera ID and the real name. Is this useful? Well, it's stored into the file, but then again, it's not like Zcam makes their own um, nonlinear video editing program. So it's not like Blackmagic where you would see these things show up in the uh, editing workflow, these labels, if you will. So it also has currently at least a very limited use for you to specify things like this, camera ID and real name. I mean, this is also sort of a increasingly outdated art form. It's sort of analogous to writing with chalk onto a clapper <laughs> in the old days of cinema. I'm pressing the down button again, and finally you can see it cycles us back. So guess what? One ninth or less done. But I'm sorry if I've rambled on a long time, but sort of my style compared to the tween, fast-paced, um, I don't know, how do I say gushing uh, video tutorials is to really just go through every damn option and there's a niche for that and that's what I'm doing here again. So I press the menu button to go back and here we are back to our, um, I don't know, rule of thirds grid if you will. And I'm pressing the down button to go next to the video category and I'm pressing OK. And once I'm in there, I have yet another option here that says variable frame rate. So there, what we mean by variable frame rate here as opposed to playback VFR is that I can actually select a frame rate that's off the standard sort of chunks or um, notched values. So when I press this, you can see now it gets really wild because I can choose something that's really non-standard. Again, why would you want to do that? And the answer is you would do that if you want to bake into the file something different than uh, the maximum that the camera can throw at you. Um, as a cynical aside, I will say to kind of finish up, but to hold my tongue on this variable frame rate and altogether on the slow motion issue, Zcam has made its name with by evidence of all of the enthusiasm you'll find at the Zcam um, manufacturer's private user group. Everybody seems to use Zcam cameras for fast motion. The main reason being that the E2, not the E2C, but the older big brother of the E2C that costs over twice as much, can shoot at 160 frames per second. And that's a great um, frame rate for overcranking into 
great buttery smooth looking slow motion. This camera can't go there. So um, the Zcam community um, seems to me like a lot of wedding videographers, shooting bridezillas who want to have their beautiful moments in slow motion. You know, you don't end up using as a creative artist slow motion for much of your running time. But there are some types of video producers, again, weddings and advertisements, where slow motion is really a big deal. So there is a niche in the Zcam world, um, or the Zcam world actually satisfies that niche. Um, so that's what all this variable frame rate stuff is about. These menus are analogous to the E2 menus too. So when you get familiar with the E2C menus, you pretty much know the E2 menus and then the flagship line, which are the full frame and super 35 sensors that are newer. Um, that's a nice thing. And that's what all these variable frame rate options are really best suited for. Not as much this camera, which tops out at 60 frames per second. Moving down to the next option, this is an important choice to make, and it's one that these days we can breathe a little bit more of a sigh of relief. I just built a monster workstation using the new um, uh, Zen 2 AMD Ryzen 3900X. It's a really fast CPU, and the result is that whereas H.265 as a codec choice used to really drive me nuts in terms of slowing things down, it just flies now, especially when I'm in Premiere and I want to have my preview window set to one quarter resolution, which is all you need. So shooting in H.265 is not, in this case, a matter of making the file sizes smaller. It's more about the fact that around the same file size can fit a lot more bit rate, a lot more color information, and so on. So there is no good argument unless you're really in a bind and you really are in a rush to edit to use H.264. If you use H.264, you're simply compromising the image quality of what you shoot. It knocks off a few, if you will, bit rates slash, how do I say, um, sharpness, if you will. It's not just sharpness, but it's a lot of factors. So stick with H.265 if you can bear it. But here's the elephant in the room, and it's once again a controversial topic that I'm a little cynical about. I genuinely hate ProRes with a passion. I've expressed that in the Black Magic context, which thankfully has been saved by B-Raw being a much better alternative to ProRes. But, you know, ProRes is from the evil empire of Apple Corporation, and it's just simply was designed for intermediate codecs for an outdated editing program called Final Cut 7. So that's my attitude about it, but I know a lot of people simply must use ProRes. If you must, the reason why you see it ghosted out here, I can't select any of these when I press the OK button, is the fact that you cannot save internally to the standard SD uh, card, which is maxes out at UHS-1, not 2. In other words, the card bus can't handle the speed of such as ProRes 422HQ. These are all ghosted out. Good news. As of the latest firmware update, and actually a few before this, but this is on version 0.93, uh, ProRes recording is enabled if you connect an external solid state drive via the USB C port. So it adds a little bulk, it adds a little awkwardness to the form factor and the rigging of this product. But if you pull that off, and if you record to such as um, a SanDisk, it's actually recommended that over the Samsung T5, which is the preferred one actually for the Blackmagic 4K. But that SanDisk um, weatherproof little uh, square rounded edges shaped SSD is very ideal for this. And that would enable these ProRes recording options. So that's what that's all about. When I get to the bottom, I can see ZRAW as well. ZRAW. Another example of something that really requires that higher bus speed of the USB-C port on the back of the E2C, which in turn can connect to a solid state drive. And then it can keep up with the even higher bit rate of ZRAW. Is ZRAW as efficient as BRAW? Totally not. It doesn't use the same sensor um, uh, sort of offloading strategy as Blackmagic has innovated. We hope, I personally hope for sure, that Blackmagic will um, sort of develop compatibility with B-RAW using the sensor information if the two companies cooperate, and I certainly hope they do. Um, kudos to Zcam for innovating a Z-RAW format, but I think they would be perfectly comfortable admitting that B-RAW is a slightly more efficient and smaller file size format than Z-RAW. 
So when I push down, I cycle back to the beginning, and here I am left with, once again, my choice. I'm sticking with H.265, I think for almost everybody who uses this camera. Remember, the camera also has limitations. The sensor itself is not gonna be able to leverage the available slightly better quality of ProRes, um, which is dramatically less compressed and dramatically larger file sizes than H.265. Also, ZRAW, same problem. It just can't leverage um, the quality to justify that. So H.265 is really providing you with what the maximum uh, that this cameras can perform anyways. So it's, it's really the intelligent choice to use in this encoder category. Pressing the menu button to go back. So we've made it through our second line of the video category. And then when we go to the third, this is a bit vague, isn't it? It just says high, medium, low. Answer. For heaven's sake, I mean, I don't understand why anybody would choose medium or low. Uh, could it be that you have a really slow SD card that you've put into the card slot of this camera and you're worried about it not keeping up? Gosh, maybe, but H.265 is not a very high bitrate format. So um, even with the 422 chroma subsampling and 10-bit color uh, that this can record internally at. So we leave it on high without any debate, please. Moving next to proxy track, this is really cool. There are some features here that have just been added as of firmware update 0.93, um, moving the next click up from 0.89, and they were really big improvements at long last. Proxy track, I believe, is one of those new features. If you turn it on, and if you have a card that can keep up and so forth, you can create a so-called proxy track. Uh, it hasn't been explained in any narrative detail, but it's pretty safe to assume that the reason this feature is offered is because of the fact that uh, H.265 continues to be a difficult format for a lot of content creators to edit, given its CPU demands. So this is a kind of interesting compromise where you can create a parallel proxy track so that you can go back to your H.264 footage. The problem with this though, is that it doesn't use the native sort of proxy creation uh, engine that one finds in examples like Adobe Premiere. So you would have to sort of manually piece together the proxy track with its original higher quality H.264 file, for example. Um, so a little bit inelegant of a solution, but at least it's a choice for you. I really love the philosophy of this company, Zcam, because it seems like their goal is to just let content creators choose, uh, make choices on a lot of bonus features that otherwise would confuse, I don't know, less, a more, uh, more consumer oriented, um, um, users. So for proxy track, um, I'm leaving it off perfectly happy with H.264. This is cool. Rotation normal. If I go into this, you'll see that I can turn it upside down. This is particularly relevant for this type of camera because um, it truly is modular. It's funny. Um, I think a lot of, I, I'm worried about this camera actually. I mean, for their sake, I think it's a great upstart camera. It broke the thousand dollar price barrier for something that approximates the performance of the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K. It costs a lot less than that. The way Blackmagic is going, the way that the 6K costs $2,500, for this to be less than a third that price is sort of extraordinary. So all that rambling is to say that one of the reasons why I think this whole product line, particularly the E2C, has had a hard time penetrating the market is because I think users say, wait a minute, there's no viewfinder. How am I going to watch stuff? So you can watch content on the tiny little screen, as I explained in the, uh, the test runs. I certainly did... Um, uh, use the tiny little screen and no viewfinder, not even my connected cell phone to frame my shots. And it suffered a little bit in terms of the horizon, but um, that's a con. But then I had this kind of epiphany or, uh, you know, Eureka, where I suddenly realized, well, the red camera gets a lot of love, but does the red camera come with a viewfinder? And the answer is totally no. This is a true modular camera system. You know, issue B, I think the real niche of this product, at least for my workflow, is to be a remote cam. So not only can you, can you connect with really long power over Ethernet cables and feed it into a central location, but you can also use a smartphone with a really powerful external Wi-Fi antenna that manages to cut through interference and weak Wi-Fi. And it's that method that I'll use via cell phone to do my monitoring anyways. 
with a big tablet, not to mention. I have a, you know, a Galaxy S4 that's 10 inches OLED screen. That's a much better viewfinder than I'd ever get with a camera with very low latency. So <laughs> to go back to the rotation, if I did say upside down, you know what it would do. And the reason we offer that feature or the reason Zcam offers that feature, I'm not them, is to be able to mount it, for example, underneath something, right? Um, and then just simply flip it. So speaks for itself. I don't know if you needed all that, but uh, it was a fun way to go on a tangent there, wasn't it? So I'm going to press down what looks like the end of the page. And sure enough, we have another one here. Time lapse um, is a word that historically means a filmmaking style that could go slow motion or fast motion in reality. But what it means today actually is um, fast motion only. So when you set this parameter, what you're basically saying is, I want um, this parameter to be the sort of adjustment amount um, that will result in my fast motion video. So you still have your sort of um, container frame rate. That's true. And we're setting the playback at default, but we can change how it actually records into the file. So basically what this is saying is how many, how long should I wait until I grab the next frame, but still keep dumping that into a file that only holds um, in my case, 30 frames per second, or specifically 29.97 frames per second. This is important when you want to save file space because most fast motion is like 10,000 times, right? Um, and if it's 10,000 times faster, you can imagine how huge the files would get if it still had to store everything at 30 frames per second. So that's why we have this feature. So I'm not going to change the setting, but you can see how this works here. And I, I, what's unusual, and I was impressed by, is that it's down to the decimal level in terms of seconds. So that's a quite a level of precision that you probably won't need, but at least again, to the spirit of what this company does, Hey, and why not give them the choice? So I'm pressing menu to go backwards and then I'm pressing down and there's one more here, VFR control course. If I toggle into that, look, there's only one option. And when I press it, it doesn't do anything. So, I actually don't know what to say about this. I think it's the only thing in the menus that currently might be a place marker for something else because it doesn't have that ghosted out quality that suggests that the mode is relevant only in a certain other mode. So I'm going to menu back out of here and just say, whatever. So I pressed down, which brought me back to the top of the menu and we are done with tile number two. And so I'm pressing menu to go backwards one and we're going to proceed to audio. This was where I was ready about a week ago to sort of bitch and moan and maybe even moot out um, a recommendation to buy this camera. This camera had huge audio problems and it's still not great, but it got a hell of a lot better. I will explain. Um, I ruined a whole shoot with this thing. Kind of pissed because what used to happen, and you can see the um, VU meters, the level indicators at the bottom of the screen, what you're seeing there is not actually the high quality um, shotgun mic that I'm actually talking into right now. You're seeing the internal camera microphones um, and what they're picking up of my sort of ambient noise, not directly into the mics. So it's picking up the ambient noise and you're seeing that it's dancing as levels should, right? It's dancing a little below, let's say negative six decibels. And then if I get really loud, it might tease the yellow zone, which would be nearing zero. And then of course, I'm not even going to, uh, you know, punish you with the red lines. But if I were screaming right now, then we see it go up into red. What used to happen before firmware version 0.93, starting from 0.89 and down, which was only like, I don't know, a matter of weeks ago, since the camera's birth, it basically stunk at audio. And the reason was, was that everything was too loud. So you would end up clipping everything. Plus there was no true logarithmic curve to the way that the um, level indicators would work. Everything seemed like it was loud, but then you couldn't sort of make a nuanced adjustment that way. So you'd end up clipping and it would just clip even if it wasn't reaching the red lines either. So it was all kinds of problems. So there are a few ways that this is brought under control more, but before we get there, Let's go in order of the menu items where we can see that the encoder is currently set to AAC. When I press OK to go into the options, you can see that encoder allows me to say none. And that means there will be no audio recorded into the multiplexed um, container file. So I could choose that and I will, 
just to show you it works. But also, I'm going to press down and press OK, and you'll see it doesn't allow me to do PCM. Um, haven't verified this, but I think I read this. Um, as in many cases, when things are ghosted out, this means that the option isn't available to me because I don't have something selected right now. And the answer is PCM does require a higher bit rate. So because it's uncompressed audio compared to my choice, AAC audio, here's why you never want to use PCM anyway. And the answer is, again, this goes to the limits of this camera. It simply can't create great quality audio. So despite the firmware improvements, the preamp on this is not good. And it's not even up to the level of even the Blackmagic Pocket 4K. It's noisy and the dynamic range and everything, right? So you're going to ceiling out in terms of the maximum capacity of the camera anyways using the compressed AAC audio format. So my recommendation is don't, don't stress about the fact that you can't record in PCM unless you dock to an external drive. Just leave it at AAC. You'll save file space too that way. So I'm pressing OK and I'm going back one with the menu button. And here we have the microphone as the selected input. When I press OK, you can see there's only another option that says off. I would say that this is probably for two reasons. Um, the main reason actually is probably just because, again, this firmware is designed to sort of work, even though you have to download the one specific to the E2C, the layout is designed to work with all of the E2 series cameras, including the flagships. So what you would see on this camera with the models that have separate line inputs than the built-in microphones, you'd have that option. On this camera, you don't. Okay, that was the first reason why. The second reason why you might want to turn it off, and you can see now the VU meters aren't running anymore. The reason why you might want to do that is because of the fact that um, if you know that you've just got sh shitty, excuse my language, sound, because it's windy or whatever else, you might want to spare your post-production team any sound at all. So you might just know that you never want to put sound into it. I'm not in favor of that because I always like the possibility of scratch noise being acceptable from even internal microphones. So I also doubt personally that you're ever going to leave it in any other setting than microphone checked. I'm going backwards. And once again, here we have, um, a great feature that was added and fixed with the firmware update. So input gain used to be uh, not logarithmic at all. And so quite literally in all the sample footage you saw, and granted, yeah, drums are allowed, but I was pressing OK and then going down. We didn't have a nice little screen like this. But most importantly, I was having to go pressing the down button progressively until I can get down to here. I was having to go down to negative 18. And when I was down at negative 18, which is quite a cut, everything was really, really loud. That also went for the shoot that I mentioned that, uh, that was ruined, brings a tear to my eye because it was a poet who was reading into a wireless mic that was not sending out loud audio at all, but it was clipping full time, even at negative 15 dB. So anyways, this has been changed and you can clearly see as the V as the audio level meters indicate that um, negative six kind of means what it says now. So I leave it at negative six as an all purpose thing, but we'll get to the automatic feature they also added in a second. So I'm pressing OK, or actually I'm going to press menu to go backwards one. If I go up to the option that lets me select manual, you can see that the other choice is auto. So if I do that, then we're really putting a lot of trust into this product, aren't we? So I'm not a the type of, I, I think anybody who buys this camera, they're sort of in the um, category of people who want control over everything. Things like focus and exposure and stuff. So I don't think you'll ever have it on audio auto unless you are in really unpredictable circumstances. But the, again, the internal mics on this camera are not very good anyways. So there's that factor too. Um, audio is automatic gain control. So you have that problem of when it's really quiet, such as right now, you won't be able to hear it um, if, because I'm using a better quality mic into the Shogun as a separate audio. But if you become quiet and silent, then the noise floor just keeps rising and rising because it's listening harder for any noise. And then when you get loud, then everything unnaturally, kind of the room tone comes down. So auto is not a good place to be unless you really are going to be running and gunning in sort of unpredictable sound environment. So I'm going to turn that back to manual. But the automatic gain control is a feature that was just added with the new firmware update. 
which has really made the camera finally arrive at a usable camera. So menu to go backwards, and then we have output gain, and that has to do with whether I, I believe it probably has something to do with whether I have headphones. The, a nice feature of the camera is that it does indeed have a headphone jack, so you can monitor in the field. My dream is for all of these products to have Bluetooth uh, monitoring for wireless headphones with aptX low latency. Um, that's my dream, and nobody's done it yet, but that would be killer. So I'm going to move down to this, which speaks for itself, doesn't it? Because you can see it overlaid on the screen there, and if I press OK and go into it, I can make it disappear. Why would I want to make it disappear? I really don't know. But I like seeing all kinds of information at all times. So I'm going to leave it enabled and press menu to go backwards. Menu to go backwards. There we go. And I'm going to press down. And look at there's only one page. So audio only has those five options. And here we are done with the top row. So I'm pressing menu to go back and moving the pressing the down button to go to the next category, which says exposure, but it actually deals with way more sort of categories of parameters than just that icon implies because that icon tends to imply um, pretty much EV, which is an exposure value that is a pretty unscientific slash unprofessional way of dealing with exposure where you tick things up and down relative to all the other settings and let things auto adjust. We're not those sorts of filmmakers in most cases. But anyways, let's break in. So you can see already exposure is talking first about flicker reduction. And the only two choices here are between 60 and 50. So you probably know by now that this is really about what country you're in. So you just want to find out whether or not you're in a North American territory, for example, that has the standard wall current of 60 hertz, or whether you're in some European countries, so-called PAL countries, where 50 hertz is the flicker rate of incandescent lights, for example. So I'm leaving mine at 60 because verily I am in the U.S. for whatever that's worth or not worth. I'm moving down to EV and you'll see it's ghosted out. Why? because I don't have any other modes set to auto because I'm a good cinematographer. If I had things set to auto and let it go all over the place, boy, what would happen? I'd have motion blur problems. I'd have zebra stripes kind of not being telling me the truth anymore. And also, well, they would tell the truth, but it would be bad. Um, you know, just to entertain you or to show the theory behind this, I'm going to go find a shutter speed that says auto and go back one. And I predict that once I do that, EV becomes eligible. So there it's not ghosted out anymore. And you can see that if I dared to sort of dive into the menus, sure enough, I could start ticking up the exposure value this way. But exposure value is the kind of thing that more traditionally, and you can see when I push that, it got brighter, right? I went plus two ticks, two whole ticks. I'm going to go back down to unity gain or zero. And when I'm there, we're sort of back to proper exposure. I know there's zebra stripes on the glare of the light reflecting on the globe in the background. That's kind of what you do sometimes. You let things blow out for the sake of the midtones. Anyways, I'm pressing menu to go backwards again. So that's what EV is all about. Uh, I think I was cutting myself off. You use EV typically when you have like a little dial on a SLR camera or DSLR um, for really quick kind of, I don't have time, you know, moments. But I'd like to turn that into a ghost again. I like to murder the EV capability by going to shutter speed, the next item down, press OK, and then uh, I'll just ram it down your throats again because I just one of my pet peeves is cinematographers who, who sort of phone in this rule rules are not made to be broken unless you have a fucking reason so and I say this to my students in film school um, but not in that tone I promise um, you really always want to obey the 180 degree shutter rule and indeed I say 180 degree shutter rule um, while knowing actually what the equivalent ratio values are, but I'm going to show you in a second how we can actually turn this menu into a degrees shutter, and we'll see that soon. But going in order, at least I know, um, and in fact, I prefer uh, numerator and denominator for shutter speed rather than degrees, because um, I still like seeing the precise scientific numbers. These are the scientific numbers to say, 
to, how do I say, to realize the rule. I currently have it at 1 60th. I have no motivation to depart from that unless I'm really in a bind. I've maxed out my ISO. It's getting too grainy. I got to change the shutter speed to make up for it or whatever. The reason why we want to keep it at 1 60th is because my frame rate is 30. So it goes one over is always the shutter speed. We're talking the 180 degree rule one over. And then what we, the number we have to choose on the bottom, the denominator is a number that is always without exception, double the current frame rate. Okay. And then when you do that, each individual frame 30 times a second will have an appropriate amount of motion blur instead of a really crisp image. So the reason why sort of GoPro skiing, you know, uh, bro videos are so stroby looking and so amateurish, not to mention most cell phone videos is because the shutter speed is set to automatically just move all over the place. And what we do instead when we're good at this is we use ND filters. So anyways, I'm going back to 1 60th, selecting it, pressing the menu button to go backwards. Okay. And we'll come back to that in a minute, but coming down to the next item. So again, this is all under the exposure category, not exactly the place we expect to see all these things, but it's certainly a place we'll be going to a lot. Of course, we'll talk soon about customizing the hotkeys, if you will, um, because these are particularly things that we're going to be adjusting so much. We don't want to be diving into these menus every time we're adjusting these things. When I go to aperture, this is a, um, this is a cheapo native micro four thirds Panasonic lens that weirdly, uh, so un non standardly does bottom out at f 2.5. So bizarre. So you can see what's weird about this is that it's making it eligible to go down farther. Yikes. So when I press 1.8 kind of thinks it can do that, uh, or maybe it can shoot. I might have a lens on that goes that low. Gosh, what a mystery. I think it does. It's a 25 millimeter Panasonic. So there I am at F 1.8. Yeah, you're right. I'm right. <laughs> but 2.5 is where I was able to get what I thought to be proper exposure. Okay. So first critique, not a big deal. Have you noticed that all of these menus do not update the image in real time? Uh Oh, that means that I really can't judge aperture, um, until I actually commit. So this is a flaw of the camera. I think it really should be improved. They should simply, you know, make the checkbox sort of invisibly move down with the highlight and then only respect the checkbox or move the check actually to your selection when you press OK. That's my recommendation to Zcam because you can see it's really bright and I'm moving all the way down to like F10 and it's only after I press OK. Boom. OK, so. That's a real big problem because as shooters without an aperture ring and what active micro four thirds lenses ever have, uh, an iris ring, right? Aperture ring. So we're really relying on this in camera manual function to get us to proper exposure, but it's a real pain in the arse to keep ticking up and committing, ticking up and committing, ticking down and committing. We can't get a real time sort of, um, preview of that. So anyways, I'm back to 2.5, which is my choice aperture of choice. And I'm pressing menu to go back again. Okay. Hey, look at this. So we've got ISO. Um, let's talk about ISO. I got into it a little bit in the field when we we're talking about the noise, but when I dig into this, you'll see that it starts at 800, which is super interesting, but that is the ongoing sort of somewhat necessary, but a little bit exaggerated by nerdy engineers curse where if you have a log format color profile, which we're getting to in these menus later, you've got to start at some minimum ISO that, um, brightens the image enough to make the curves effective. Because remember that what log format does is it sort of tries to lift the shadows and bring down the highlights and sort of squeeze everything into the middle region of a waveform and then store it safely that way, sort of not stress out the camera sensor nor the recording media. And then of course in post-production, we apply 
um, hopefully Zlog's own free Premiere plugin or plugin for other nonlinear video editing applications, and then unpack it into the full dynamic range. So if I were below 800, then um, I might not have a lot of material to work with in order to do those sort of apply the log curve and then to unapply the log curve with the same formula. I'll stop there, but there's a lot of reading that you can do on the web if you've never heard of this. But I think for a lot of you, this is pretty commonplace. You've seen this on pretty much every camera that has log mode. Uh, I'm a big proponent of log. I will sneer right now and then expand on it later. I think this Z-Log community who buys this camera, I don't know what their deal is, but they never seem to want to shoot in log. It might be because they're not fond of Z-Log, I think, although I think Z-Cam did a great job of implementing a log format much better than Sony. Because Z-Log has a very Airy Alexa um, flatness to it. It's very gradable and it grades really nicely with a lot of other camera manufacturers. So anyways, um, and by the way, that's why the minimum ISO is at such a relatively high value of 800. So it only goes up from there. Is 800 noisy on this camera? Well, in the low noise compression codec, it's actually pretty decent. So 800 on my RX0 Sony in um, S-Log2 is horrible. I mean, it's just as noisy as an antenna in the analog TV era. It's terrible. But 800 on this sensor, which is essentially a GH4 sensor, is really clean. But if we go up, and of course I'm going to, again, by the way, more complaining here is that you can see how there's no real-time preview as I keep ticking up my ISO. But when I get up to 3200, which is going to be way too bright here, right? When I go there, if I zoom in really tight into a dark area of the image, you'll see some noise, but it's manageable, right? Um, but I'm going to go back down to my minimum. So um, there's not much more to say here than, than you already know, except for the fact that, yeah, there is an auto mode. But something that might be a little bit confusing about auto mode is that um, if I'm in auto mode, it doesn't make me eligible to go below 800 any time that I'm in the Z-Log2 picture profile. So there's that going on too. It'll only go up from there. But I always like locking my ISO into a set value. So that's what I'm doing here. So I'm pressing menu to go back. I'm going to go down one more. And then we have minimum ISO. That's pretty interesting. So that's only activated, and I'm going to do it for you right here. If I go to auto mode, if I go there, we've seen this before, haven't we, that something that was grayed out becomes eligible, and so I press that, and then I can then say, well, I don't want to go anywhere below a certain ISO value. And so what that does is it sort of creates a plateau. Right? Maybe plateau is not the word. It creates a, uh, indeed, a minimum. Um, this is valuable when you don't want to have the camera sensor fooled by, let's say, um, a, a very bright environment. Um, so if you are running and gunning and you want to have the uh, ISO be in a sort of automatic mode, um, don't be confused this auto with the other auto. This means actually turning off minimum ISO when it says auto here. They actually should have said off. It's another comment. But here I could be saying, yeah, I realize that it's really bright out, but I still want you to have the ISO cranked up to a minimum of, let's say, 1250, because I also know that I really have a lot of dark shadows content that I don't want to sacrifice on account of the bright stuff that I see in the image. But anyways, I'm going to go back to auto here, which really means off. And then I'm going to go back to ISO, and I'm going to tick into this, and again, set it to the minimum ISO in Zlog2 mode, which is 800. Keep my noise to a minimum going to go down and one more down. We have maximum ISO. I'm not going to show this to you, but it's exactly what I just said, right? It's sort of for the opposite situation where if I have um, a situation where I sort of want to keep things dark, I want to manage my noise levels. I never want to let the camera jack up the ISO so much that I'm just getting a staticky, noisy image. Um, then I can set a maximum ISO. So that's great if you're in auto ISO mode, but right now it's ghosted out because we're not. We set it at 800. Pressing down to maximum shutter speed, and we have the same sort of thing. But since this is a new category, I'm going to go ahead and go back to auto, which is the only way to make that grayed out thing, grayed out category eligible. And when I go down here, there's maximum shutter speed. And again, the reason why this is particularly valuable is because when I was sneering at the jocks with their GoPro ski cams, 
Um, what I'm basically saying is that at a certain point, it starts to look really stroby and amateur, but there is a threshold when that really gets bad, and it's certainly not as high as 1 1 20th. It really starts looking terrible once you're getting up to these numbers, like 1 3 20th. So unless you're shooting the first half hour of Saving Private Ryan for an actual intelligent reason, um, you could actually use this mode fairly effectively if you're really, you don't have an ND filter with you, you sort of are under challenging lighting situations, running and gunning. You could at least say, fine, I'm not going to obey the 180 degree rule, but I'm at least going to put a limit on how bad things will go by breaking the rule. And that's what this is all about. But once again, I'm just going to sort of negate this. It's going to become uneligible anyways when I go back here, go back to my shutter speed category, turn it from auto to obeying the rule, which is 1 60th, okay? So back down to the maximum shutter speed. And then we have metering mode. So you're familiar with this from this when it comes to um, DSLRs, for example. I like center. So you'll see that I've selected it. It's also the first in, in the list, and it's an intelligent choice for this model and this make of camera. Why? Because it's honestly not very good. So this is, Zcam is a cinema camera manufacturer. So they don't, they didn't spend years and years refining their photography-centric DSLR um, camera technology. They're working on it in the focusing area, which we'll get to, which is pretty interesting as an add-on accessory. But as for metering exposure, I think it's wise to just kind of accept the limitations of the camera and do center metering. Because this camera is not going to be ideal for running and gunning and having things in a very complex way adjust to circumstances. Because it's kind of not good at that. So if I set it to average, I found that it got fooled quite a lot in a somewhat less elegant way than something like my Sony a7 III. Um, spot is of course when you can adjust the location of the spot and that's recommended for interviews for example where you might want to locate the spot on what's most important in the frame which of course in the interview is the actual person that you're talking to but all of those things uh, at least led me in my experience to go ahead and select center so I'm gonna leave it there going down we have shutter operation speed when I click OK into that you can see how if I this is really uh, I guess it could have gotten a better label, but what this is really basically saying is um, measurement technique or display uh, mode. Because when I select angle and then I go back, then you'll see when I go up to shutter speed that now the way it measures things in shutter speed is under angle. And then you can see I have to go down. The reason I don't like this interface too is that then you have to go down a really long list, don't you? You have to get all the way down to 180 if you want to have proper uh, motion blur. So, I mean, I'm sort of like, uh, what, I'm sounding suspicious, aren't I? Because here I am nagging about how you should always have it at 180, the rule of the 180 degree shutter angle rule. The reason why you do have choices to do other shutter angles is for things like time lapse. If you want to create motion blur that um, sort of within each individual frame is very gooey, that looks great when you've got you know, really fast um, uh, uh, time lapse. So that's why we, one of the reasons why we can choose these things. In any case, I've, you can see I've selected it here, but when I go back and choose my display mode of choice, which is not angle, but rather speed, then I hope it'll take me back to 1 60th, and there it is, okay? All right, so we took a peekaboo at the top, but we're going back down, and then we can see that this is also um, ghosted out. This is yet another great new addition to firmware version 0.93. I'm glad I'm doing, I'm procrastinated doing this thing um, uh, for a long time, but I'm so glad I did because at the time when I was planning to do this, um, I was below 0.93 and all these features weren't here, but this, is something that a lot of other camera manufacturers don't have yet, and it's killer, because what this does is it changes the speed. We've seen this on, like my a7 III, for example. I love this with the continuous autofocus, um, because then you get more elegant rack focuses than that sort of pop, 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 that sort of like, you know, mechanical-looking um, 
lost in the woods, sort of scrambling to find tack sharp focus behavior. This is very similar where, and I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to show this easily in this setup here, but uh, it basically says when the exposure automatically changes, if I have things in automatic mode, it'll do so much more slowly. That's what that basically is all about. Maybe I can show you. I'm going to go ahead and do this. I'm going to go ahead and change one of these categories to, um, let's do it in ISO. Let's go ISO, auto. And now that we're in auto mode, I'll be eligible to select the, um, the AE speed. And you can see how I have it on slow. So we are filmmakers. We are not still photography people. So in my opinion, slow is the only place you want to be because that looks more organic, more natural, more cinematic, if you will. So I'm going to leave it on slow and then I'll take the lights down. So I've got natural lighting here. And as I take the lights down, it's raising the exposure, but it did so elegantly and slowly. Do you see what I mean here? So if, and you can see it's getting really grainy, right? Because now the ISO jumped up to 1600 to compensate. I still have a little key light. In fact, I'll just go all the way. If I turn off my key light, you see how that speed of the ISO is sort of ramping up. That would have been a little bit le more clumsy, if you will, if we had let it um, do it at the fast speed, which didn't used to be an option. So I'm putting this back on and I'm putting this back on and you'll see it's elegantly and slowly taking us back down to our probably minimum ISO. And I'm going to get my light going again. And I got to do that this way. I don't know. I think that my new aperture light is sort of locked up. Is that possible? There we go. Strange behavior. I'm loving this new aperture RGBW light. Okay. So back to the menus. So we've got AESP set to slow. That's kind of where we're going to keep it. Um, and then we have lock in record. This is another new feature added just recently with a firmware. So lock in record basically says, um, once I've begun recording, I don't want to let any of these automatic setting adjustments um, to, in this exposure category change at all. So that's a particularly great feature. I actually have historically enjoyed that a lot more with white balance, which we're going to see in that menu in a second. But um, it can be useful in this context too. Again, if you're panning the camera and it's going from direct sunlight to somewhere else during the course of your shot, you don't want it to look cheap and to kind of radically change the exposure based on that change. You just let the sun blow out, right? Because your destination is something that's darker or in the shadows. So I'm leaving that on right now, but then it's not going to be relevant anymore when I press down, get back to the top of the menu and get myself back to the ISO being at its minimum. So I'm going to go back to 800, press OK. And there I am back again, right? So 800 ISO. And everything's back where I wanted it to be, right? Cool. Everything does look a little brighter, though, doesn't it? So I'm going to take my aperture down to 2.8. Boom. Okay, menu back and menu back. That took a long time, didn't it? But there's a lot of content in that exposure category, and it's where we're going to be spending most of our time as camera operators. But the good news is we're going to assign most of those to hotkeys because there's uh, uh, um, technically about six of them we can use, but particularly three on the front panel that are very useful. Okay, moving along. White balance. Pressing OK to go into that, and then sure enough, we have mode. And, you know, unlike DSLRs, they're not cute little pictures of the sun or a light bulb. But we certainly do get um, uh, some of the, you know, narrative um, words for that, which is incandescent right now, isn't it? If I press auto, probably won't change much because these days automatic white balance sensor, uh, you know, sensors automatically sensing white balance do a pretty great job. But again, over the course of a shot, we're going to see how maybe we want to lock that even if we have it in auto mode. So that's where that value comes in. But again, most professional cinematographers just simply don't leave in an auto. So you have to really discipline yourself to really choose the one that fits. 
we have cloudy. Um, and as we go down the list, if you, if you know color science or Kelvin values, we're just ever increasing the Kelvin value until we get to what has the highest Kelvin value, um, which is shade. But then we also have manual. So if I tap this, then if I press the menu button to go backwards, then these two are eligible. They weren't before, right? They were grayed out. But now I can just press OK, and I can change the value manually. So I know for a fact that 3200 Kelvin is, you know, the standard incandescent, so I'm there. But what they also added in the .93 firmware update is tint. And this can be really important. In my experience, even though tint needs to go hand in hand with color temperature represented by Kelvin values, which is basically uh, the one axis of the color wheel that goes between orange and blue. The reason why tint is valuable is because it's the other X segment of that axis at a 90 degree angle that's cutting between, if you will, sort of like green and yellow or red and green. It's kind of in the zone there, right? What tint tends to do, um, apart from white balance issues, even though this is all in the white balance category, isn't it? But what tint does is that even though we're really talking mostly about the range between orange and blue, the filters that we use um, and other sort of color pollution that occurs in the real world makes us always want to be sensitive also to nudging things in the direction more red or less red, right? More red, more green. So if I push up, I'm sorry if I press into it and then say up, I'm going to see if we can actually notice it. When I really radically improve the tint number, you can see it goes quite a lot in the red direction. I'm back to my critique, though, that the real-time updating sort of doesn't happen, right? So it's only when I let go that it kind of gets me to my value, right? But sure enough, if I go way down the tint value, I bet it's going to look green. So poor John Deke, the composer there, is going to have a green face. There we are, and everything will look green. So none of that's good. But it could be good if we had a sort of ND filter that's polluting things and making things have a green tint to it. Then we'd push it in the up direction, wouldn't we? Right? So that's what tint's all about. So it's a great that they added that. So I'm going to press menu to go backwards. Um, these are ghosted out. That's interesting. So let's see if they come back when we are in auto mode. And now I'm in auto mode and I press menu to go back and to explore more of the menu. And sure enough, I have lock in record currently set to off. So I'm going to turn this on, even though it's not going to be relevant unless I'm in auto mode, but this is always a good idea, isn't it? Because you're going to want to stage your shot so that there isn't like moving from indoors to outdoors. And even so you'd probably do better to keyframe that in post-production. So locking in the course of any given one shot from start to finish from on to off is a great idea, especially when it comes to white balance. Again, this is a new firmware update feature. So there's that. Okay. Uh, so uh, we have that white priority um, option also ghosted out, but again, that would have to do if we were in a specific value. And so here I am in incandescent, and um, it's still ghosted out. Oh boy, let's figure that out. We'll go in here, and maybe choose a specific uh, value of manual, go back, and then it's still ghosted out, isn't it? So. I can't tell you what the answer is there, but um, yeah, we'll see. I'm going to go back into white balance. I'm going to turn it to not manual, but I'm going to make a deliberate choice to choose what I know this environment to be, which is incandescent. One critique I'm going to have later is that there you can assign a hotkey to the white balance function, but very unfortunately, it only works, it only actually does anything. Um, when you're in the manual mode. If I'm in incandescent right now and I use the hotkey to change white balance, it literally just ignores me. So that's, uh, I would call that a product flaw. So we've made our way through all of the white balance ca uh, categories in that sub menu. I'm going to go backwards and move on to focus, which <laughs> is a feature that very, again, very few of these Zcam E2C users will uh, mess with, not to mention the fact that you're a cinematographer and automatic focus is certainly not something in your world. However, 
There is a reason why actually the E2C as a camera might be something that you end up using autofocus for a lot. And again, given the test footage that you saw and my need to pull tack sharp focus on a 4K resolution, uh, you know, product um, was because I was using that tiny little screen where you simply cannot pull focus. And quite frankly, if you're hooking up a cell phone to this, it's also sort of not the best way to pull focus. It might be too dark. You don't have your eye up to an eye cup, all that stuff. So you might want to use a native active lens, such as in this micro four thirds format and use the autofocus function for a one push autofocus. That's what I have currently set up. And that's what I want, always want to keep this camera on. What that means is that if you're in autofocus mode, it's sort of a misleading term because if you see autofocus, that implies that it will autofocus all the time, but that's actually continuous autofocus, but it gets even more confusing than that. The way Zcam worded all of this, which they should re rethink, I think. When I have it in autofocus, I'm making it eligible for pulling focus using the camera's active lens. Okay, so we'll see what that means in a second. Now, of course, if I have it set to manual focus, that makes it eligible for me to actually twist the lens ring. So I'm leaving the menus for a second. I'm going to show you. I'm actually able to turn my, um, whatchamacallit, we call this uh, focus by wire lens. And so I'm turning it and I'm going to pull focus on the globe. We'll talk about peaking in a minute, right? So I've got, I'm going to leave that for a while. You've been looking at Scrooge a little for a little while now. I'm going to leave that blurry. If somebody enters into this video later on, I didn't make a mistake. I actually meant to have the foreground out of focus for a while. Um, so anyways, let me go back to the menus and we'll see that that enabled us to turn the thing. So this is a bit of a, um, I think a hassle because what I like is being able to flip quickly between autofocus and manual focus. The weird thing is, is that even if I have it in autofocus, I have bad news for you because if I have it in autofocus, if you believe me, I'm turning the, um, focus ring right now and it's unable to control focus. It's a huge bummer, right? Because it's not in continuous autofocus mode. If it was, it would try and pull focus on the foreground, wouldn't it? But I, uh, I have it in autofocus mode. Um, and because of that, it ruins my ability to pull focus with the ring on the camera. That's not cool. But living with that as we must, um, the next thing we can try is to actually try pulling focus on what's in the foreground. So I guess Scrooge is back. I'm going to press the OK button. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. I meant to be out of the menus and then do it. So when I press OK, you can see it tried, but then it pulled focus on the globe. So why did it do that? Well, let's find out. If I go back into the focus menu, I'll see that the focus area is set to flexible zone right now. So I expressed earlier the virtue of center um, spot metering when it comes to exposure. I sort of feel the same way about focus area but the unfortunate fact is that there's only a choice between human track, which is not well described by Zcam, but probably has something to do with human eyes versus flexible zone. So uh, we don't have any humans in this shot, even though it's a picture of one, his eyes aren't open, right? So I'm going to leave it on flexible zone. There's a few more choices, right? I can go to focus area size. I can make it small. And if I do that, then it's probably going to focus a little more on the crosshairs. So... Sure enough, as soon as I did that, by pressing OK, it actually activated a pull focus command, um, which I normally have to do when I'm out of all the menus. So it did it. If I go back down to large, though, it's going to stay there because it wasn't somewhere else. But that's what caused the problem originally. I'm going to go ahead and leave it on medium for compromise purposes. But you can see how when I was there before, it refused to pull focus on the foreground. So one could call that bad autofocus as a technical matter. The autofocus of this camera is um, what's called contrast detection, but not um, phase detection. So phase detection is the more advanced layer. And you're, what, what the best cameras do is they combine both contrast and phase detection. This camera is only capable of contrast detection. So it's just simply half-baked. But then again, we're cinema shooters, right? So we don't tend to use autofocus. But to the extent that we're using the tiny little viewfinder 
or we just want to quickly pull focus as a starting point, I love the fact that this has one touch autofocus, again, with that rubber OK button on the top of the panel by default. So we've got change focus area here, though, so that's cool. And actually, once I activate it, then I can move the focus area around, which is currently not visible. Um, it's one overlay that actually does not show up on the HDMI output. So I think that's kind of technically a mistake. I think that um, Zcam, if they were going to send out all of the on-screen data anyways to pollute our pure image HDMI stream, they might as well have put on the overlay of the focus area. But on my tiny little monitor on the top of the camera, I'm seeing the focus area move according to my cursor buttons. Pressing OK, and then I'm back, and I have to go back into the menus, go into focus. So I was able to move the focus area around, and that actually would have solved the problem. So if I go and change the focus area now, you can't see I'm doing it, but what I'm actually doing is I'm moving the focus area to the left so that now, I'm sorry, to the right, so that now it's set to be on the globe. And then as soon as I did that, look what it did. It pulled focus on the globe. And now I'm moving the focus area over to the left onto the Blu-ray case. And when I press OK, it's pulling focus on the case, right? This is pretty handy. I would use that during an interview, wouldn't I? Because normally you offset people. You don't have interview subjects dead center. You have them off to the side. Let's go back into the focus menu. So I changed the focus area. So here's the sort of weird wording problem. I'm going to reveal all of the options so that we have them all on the screen at the same time. Continuous autofocus is on, and what that means is that anytime I push the OK button, I can pull focus, quote, automatically, right? But live continuous autofocus is sort of a modifier on continuous autofocus that means don't stop, don't wait for the operator to push the OK button, but just constantly pull focus. So when I push that and I say on, then that means that if something sort of changes, then it'll try to pull focus. So let's see how that works. I'm going to throw this here. And well, I guess that wasn't the best example. It's trying, isn't it? You can see how it's racking around and then it sort of remains unsatisfied by that. I'm going to inspire it a little more by adding some height or at least blocking more of it. Is it going to try now? Nope. So the last thing to do, I'm going to ruin my framing here, but if I sort of turn it over, let's see if it tries to pull, and it still didn't. So I would say that this is not I would say that this is not the best camera for autofocus because you can see how it's simply not um, honoring my foreground. And you can see it's still trying, isn't it? One of the reasons is that it's maybe too close for contrast detection to work, but it's just simply not performing. And you notice how it just finally grabbed it? So as to why it finally grabbed it, hard to tell. You know, this is not a good autofocus test, but I think what it revealed is that, you know, it's no Sony a7 III or it's no dual pixel autofocus on a Canon Cinema, C Cinema EOS camera. They are developing a external add-on um, optional module that will interface with some of their flagship cameras, but not probably not the E2C. So that's something to look out for. I'm going to take this out of your view. And there it goes, automatically pulling focus again in live continuous autofocus mode. So I think I've exhausted this topic, but you can see how it's sort of troubled, isn't it? So let me go ahead and turn that off because I'm rarely going to use it. But now that we know that we can have it, we can certainly set the continuous autofocus sensitivity. And that is not as much the racking speed as it has to do with, you know, how much movement or how much contrast change do you, does the camera expect to inspire it to even begin to pull focus in the same way that I would if I press the rubber OK button on the top panel? That's what re that's really all about. I haven't found that I had any reason to change it from middle um, because high was too much and low was too little. So there's where I am. 
Manual focus assist, of course, is a great feature that we're familiar with on many SLRs. So if I go ahead and turn this back to manual focus, which makes it eligible for me to turn the lens ring, I'm going to go back down to the bottom again for that option. Now it's activated and I can turn it on for preview and I can even turn it on for recording. I don't know why they offer that feature. It never would be useful to me because, um, for that to, to temporarily zoom in so rapidly on account of trying to pull focus, um, zoomed in for the purpose of pulling focus, I wouldn't want that burned into my footage. It simply doesn't make sense to me, so I'm leaving that off. But you'll notice now that when I turn the focus ring, it pops me in, in my opinion, not enough. But it gives me about a two times magnification, so I can really, you can see get my peaking as solid as possible. And that's my sweet spot, I think. And then when I stop doing anything, then it bounces back. So if I had recording on, it would actually record that sort of, I don't know, how do I say jump cut? And we don't want that. So I'm gonna menu out. And sure enough, that was the bottom. So we are now done with focus. I'm gonna turn this back on to autofocus, but again, just to seal this, to, to, to wrap up, Leaving it on autofocus doesn't mean that it behaves like autofocus as we're as we normally know it, because all that means is that now I can push the OK button and rack it at a moment in time. OK, so I'm going to menu out to go to the next option, which is image. And here we are. Item number one is that sort of argumentative topic. I've already sneered, you know, whatever. I got thick skin, but then nobody cares what I have to say about all this. But my opinion is don't use anything other than Z-Log2. I've already said that I think they did a killer job in implementing their log format, not to mention the fact they give you a free plugin, um, not only a LUT file, but a suite of parameters that you can control if you drop it, for example, in Premiere onto any clip. So we have Z-Log2. There's no Z-Log1 option. There is hybrid log gamma to the extent that you're going to output eventually in Rec 2020 for HDR. Very few of us do that. And on top of that, HLG is a compromise too. So it's not like you get, it's not like it just keeps getting better because of the fact that you're in HDR. It doesn't control highlights as well as Z log too. So there's not much of a reason to go to HLG unless you really have a client or a final output in HDR. And how often is that for any of us? The answer is almost never. So there's that. Okay, so I'm leaving it on Zlog too, but you can see there's a lot of other very more obscure options um, as we move along, not in the image profile, but in the um, monitor viewing, which we'll see in a second. So I'm leaving it on Zlog and I'm going menu backwards. And then on sharpness, I have it on weak right now. And then once again, I'm gonna say that's a great choice, a few reasons. Okay, and we don't need to spend much time on this because you know this already, right? But this is similar to the theme I was mentioning earlier about like every sensor sort of has some form of noise reduction because raw sensor data is very noisy to begin with. Similarly, raw sensor data is not tack, tack, tack sharp. So there's that factor to consider. And that by adding some sharpness to the image that's being acquired by the sensor, it's sort of par for the course. Certainly purse cameras, cheapo cameras that we've bought for years, um, the phones, the, the cameras in our cell phones, they add a lot of sharpening to our images so that the raw sensor data would look a little blurry-ish compared to the tack sharpness we get from something like a Pixel 4 um, by Google. But for cinema shooters, we would like to have the maximum latitude to control things on our own and to not artificially sharpen images. So weak is a good choice. And isn't that interesting? Weak already proves my thesis because weak says you can't not sharpen the image during the process of debayering it, it, but you certainly can minimize the impacts of the inevitable sharpening that happens when you convert raw sensor data into video streams. Last point on this, and I'll shut up, is for sure that for heaven's sake, we're shooting in ultra HD, which is uh, which is 3840 by 2160 pixels. So in that sort of, you know, space, sharpness is radically reduced as a problem, isn't it? So um, what our real challenge is, is pulling focus more than these minutia of whether or not how sharp the image is in, in terms of processing. 
this is really a legacy of HD and below HD uh, era um, concerns because by the time you're at 4K, this is less of an issue. So we leave it at weak. It's my recommendation anyways. But sure enough, if we were in another mode then log, it makes sense, doesn't it, that we can't customize brightness, saturation, contrast. Um, we'll get to that in a minute. But those three parameters of brightness, saturation, and contrast, it's we, we shouldn't be able to adjust them in log because log literally means, by its very term, a formula that has to be applied identically at the unpacking stage, where, again, we're, we're crunching the where we're bringing down the highlights we're raising the shadows and then we're not we're applying that formula in reverse when we turn it back into rec 709 so we don't want these other values screwing around with our precise formula if we do have it of course on rec 709 if i go back you can see now i'm eligible to adjust brightness saturation contrast i'm going to explain right now but definitely expand a little bit more why the image suddenly actually isn't this weird how the image now looks like it's log it's bizarre isn't it what that means is that um it's not being it's it's taking things exactly as they are because what was happening before was i was shooting in log but what you were seeing on your screen which is the hdmi output of the camera was baking the LUT back into the image not for recording purposes but just for monitoring so when I went into Rec. 709 mode, it was something that's flat-ish, but it wasn't as punchy as the Z-Log2 stacked with the conversion back Z-Log2 LUT that made everything look punchy. So it'll make sense more of the, when we get back to this. But when we go back to Rec. 709 and turn it back into Z log two, you can see everything looks, if you will, normal now. Now it looks like true Rec. 709, but with better managed highlights and more dynamic range, which is the whole point of shooting in Z log two. And those are ghosted out. Last menu item was luminance level. You can see I have it at full. Um, this is the difference between 16 to 235 values versus zero to 255. You've probably seen this in your scopes in Premiere and other programs like that, or DaVinci Resolve. Um, Limited is also the sort of limitations of broadcast and DVDs, for example. So if you know you're authoring for those sort of limited formats, there's that. But most of us are digital filmmakers today where our final output is going to be in not consumer electronic playback machines, but rather just on frickin' YouTube, right? Or Vimeo or whatever. Or live screenings in theaters where we have the full dynamic range where it goes from 0 to 255 rather than the skinnier range of 16 to 235. So full's the place to be for most of us. And that takes care of the entire image menu. So we're really in the home stretch here, believe it or not. And we're at Connect, the second to last tile. And when we go into that menu, we have Network, USB, and HDMI. The first time I'm doing this and explaining this in flowchart format, because these really are three very different categories under Connection. It's best grouped here, but they really have very different meanings. I can't demonstrate right now connect network. And when I dig into it, actually, you'll see that Wi-Fi is currently off. And we also have Ethernet mode router. So actually, network takes care of the two possible ways that I can connect this camera to another device. When it comes to connecting via Wi-Fi, most typically, it will be that you connect the camera to a smartphone or a tablet using Wi-Fi. And so here I would turn it on. And there's no harm in leaving it on except for that it consumes battery power if you don't need it, right? But here I have it on. You can see that it identifies what the SSID is. And it'll be pretty, pretty easy to see once you're trying to pull it from your smartphone or your tablet. And then it also identifies what the IP address is, the fixed IP address for this device, the Zcam. So now we're all good to go with regard to Wi-Fi. In other words, it's active and ready to receive. But as a separate matter, there's also this Ethernet mode. And so there is an Ethernet port on the back of the product, and that lets you network a few or even just one device into a sort of receiving computer, right? So it doesn't do like the full capabilities of the camera. In other words, this isn't like a pure 4K HDMI output. Um, and there's a little bit of latency too, but 
um, this manages, in other words, the parameters for how to connect this into a Ethernet network, especially when you have a multicam shoot for live production or live streaming. That is not something I do, but at least you can see the options that are available here. This is saying, it, it, this really has a lot to do with DHCP, which is Dynamic Host Control Protocol, I believe is what that means, but it's basically assigning IP addresses. Do we have the router do it? Do we set it here? Do we have it set to a, or do, do we have it set to a static address or do we have a d direct connection to the router? Um, so these are all options that are not relevant to most of us unless you're doing live streaming and it's beyond the purview of this tutorial for sure. But I'm just showing it to you anyways. This is ghosted out because if I had it in the static mode, then I'd be able to set the IP address. I'm going backwards again. So that was that first of three major categories under connection. But when I go to USB, this is something that also was recently improved by a firmware. The E2C used to stand alone compared to the E2 and now the flagships where for some crazy reason you couldn't connect an Android phone directly via USB to uh, directly control and get a viewfinder view using the Zcam for Android app of the camera. Also, I'll show you in a few minutes the actual interface in the smartphone app which is really wonderful because you have a touch screen, you can directly control things instead of digging through all these menus and so on. But if you connect through Wi-Fi, of course, that's subject to interference, disconnection, profiles, all that stuff. But there's nothing better than just a solid wire going from the USB port, charging port, if you will, on your smartphone or tablet into the E2C. The Android connection didn't work until a few weeks ago. So now, we have this host mode where we can connect via USB, but you can also tether from a computer using USB and control the product because there's a free software you can download from the Zcam website that can use USB via computer to control and receive content from the Zcam E2C. So we have host, but we also have mass storage. So what is that? Simply put, mass storage is the way that you can connect an external solid state drive via the USB-C port on the back of the Zcam E2C, and then we become eligible to record into ProRes, or grumble grumble, or ZRAW to the extent you think it's worth it. Once again, I've made the argument ZRAW is not worth it on this camera because the sensor can't even keep up with the capacity of ZRAW. So H.265, more than enough. But what H.265 may not be more than enough for is if you wanted a terabyte or so of disk space, right? So you still might want to dock an external SSD in H.265 if you want to leverage the additional size of an SSD. Another reason people like docking SSDs onto cinema cameras these days is because if you have a fast SSD, then you can just hook it into your computer and edit off that SSD, right? You can treat it like another fast drive in your computer. So it's another incentive for this mass storage capability. So in this same USB menu, we can see the word network, and that's the same word as we saw before back here, right? But the difference is, is that this type of network connection uses the USB port, whereas the other kind up here used Wi-Fi and Ethernet, right? So it's yet another way to sort of tether the camera um, using the USB port, and it kind of deserves its own category, right? In addition, there's this serial option, which um, sort of baffles me to be honest, but I think it has to do with probably the um, other product lines of cameras. And so this firmware sort of ported over the capability to use a serial bus, but there's certainly no traditional serial port on this product, i.e. I remember the old days of RS-232 DB9 um, nine pin connectors for serial data. Um, USB is itself actually universal serial bus, but I think the word serial here means using some other connector on a different camera for um, more control. So anyways, we aren't using that function either. So in sum, uh, you're probably going to leave this on host most of the time to the extent that you have a wired control device such as a smartphone or tablet, but then you'll switch to mass storage anytime you're docking an external um, drive. Just to finish up on that thought, um, I currently um, only use SD cards because of the fact that they're so cheap, even up to a terabyte, but certainly 512 gigabyte um, SD cards 
are so incredibly inexpensive. And also the H.265 bit rate for this camera don't even come close to maxing out the sort of top speeds of even mediocre SD cards. So there's no UH2, UHS-2 bus on this camera. So it essentially means that um, there's really not much of a reason to use an SSD externally unless, <laughs> like I said earlier, you're one of those people who are fanboys of ProRes or of um, Zero. Okay, finally, we have HDMI, and this is actually a really important um, uh, section. So I'm gonna go into HDMI, and we'll see a lot more sub options. And it's what has certainly has been used to create this video because in making this video, um, like I said at the beginning, the whole setup here is that I'm feeding you an HDMI output from the camera that does leave the display info on. So sure enough, if I go here and I turn off, I'm going to deny you a few information. And you're not going to see from now on after I press off the things that I can see, right? So now I can see things that you can't see. And what you're getting now is the actual, not raw, if you will, but the real output of the sensor prepared with the exact aspect ratio. You'll notice black bars at the top and bottom because we're in true cinema 4K mode, right? So it's not filling out the full 16 by 9 aspect ratio of your monitor slash um, video frame, right? So it's giving us a truer representation of the actual image without any overlays. So we definitely have that going on. And then I'll just let you know I'm turning it back on now so we can see the overlays again. And I'm gonna press menu to go backwards. But we have two different layouts. So currently, and you will be able to see the change here, I currently have it on type two because I like it better. All it is is you can see right now on the screen, I'm gonna menu out of this actually so we can really concentrate on all the visible parameters. I love how Zcam laid this out because you can just see everything on screen but it's really nice and small. You can see starting from top left and moving clockwise, we have aperture, shutter speed, ISO value, white balance in Kelvin. We have the temperature of the camera, which is pretty interesting. It's almost like it's paying respects to the agony of Sony a7S II shooters, right? When the camera kept shutting down all the time because it got too hot. I have not had the E2C shut down after very long sessions, including now. So it seems like it's safe, but nonetheless handy for them to prove the durability of the camera by giving us an actual temperature value there. I'm not a big fan of the 7.2 7 volts rating because it's not a how full is the battery number. What we do know is that it can get about as high as 8 point something. So I guess we're supposed to be able to guess as it creeps down to 7 and below that we're in trouble. So there you have it. So still moving clockwise, now at the bottom right, and you can see the color profile that's current, which is the, the glorious Z-Log2. Then next we see the codec that's active. So right now it says H.265, but it might have said ProRes LT or something like that, right? We have the frame rate next. Then we have the resolution, which in this case is Cinema Aspect 4K, True 4K, parentheses LN for low noise. And then we have, I believe that's telling us how much time we have left on my current 128 gigabyte SD card, which is pretty amazing when you think about it, because this is really high bit rate, um, 10 bit 422 video in UHD or in 4K resolution on a tiny little 128 gigabyte card, and it's still got all that space. So there's that. And then finally, we have the standby icon. And so that would, of course, turn red if I were recording. Again, remember, I'm not doing any recording on the E2C. Um, I'll go ahead and do it just for fun. You can see when I pressed the record button, then it's starting to count up. It's recording internally to the camera, whereas from the HDMI output, you are seeing um, the Shogun record the HDMI output, right? That's what you've been looking at. When I press stop, though, on my E2C, it may trigger the Shogun to also stop recording. And yet, it did not. So we'll see next about the fact that there is a parameter that in some cases, in fact, frankly, in most cases, I thought would actually trigger the Atomus Shogun to stop recording, but um, we'll see that in a second. So anyways, I'm going to go back to the menus. And that was... Um, what we're talking right now, that was all about showing you the current kind of layout 
of the on-screen display. But if I go to type one, you'll just see that it does a little bit more of an overlay, right? So it's maximizing the screen real estate. It's showing the image as it would be, but it's truly treating all of the metadata for the camera settings as overlays on top of the video image. So, um, you know, it, it, it increases the screen real estate of the actual image itself. But depending on the environment, you could find that it sort of allows too much interference with the parameters and makes it harder to read, especially on a small screen. So it's a choice you make. I prefer type two. It's just my choice. So I'm going to menu back. So that's on-screen layout. So here we have format and it's currently set to auto. Um, auto is a good choice, isn't it? Because if I set it to something else, I'd probably be just simply doing my best to match what the source, um, uh, I'm sorry, what the recording codec is. So in, in a reality, by making different choices here, I would be able to sort of really sort of punch into the image. It's almost like a framing guide, but in a real time sort of like view of, of how much to see of any given image. Um, I see very little value to this, um, unless perhaps um, the there's some reason that has to do with a disconnect between the recording mode and what HDMI is sending out. Remember, HDMI is basically a handshaking medium or protocol where the target recorder, in this case, the Atomos Shogun, is sort of getting, getting whispered information to it silently about what resolution is coming through. And automatic usually works for everything in the universe. But if HDMI handshakes are sending bad information, that's why we have these options to be able to force it to interpret um, the HDMI output in some other format than what it actually, we know that it is, okay? So I'm gonna menu back. And then finally, related to that point, I currently have EDI, EDID enabled. EDID is a part of, but not the whole of, all of that HDMI handshaking technology that I was just describing. I can't think of any incentive to disable EDID unless EDID, the good EDID information that the Zcam E2C does output is being misinterpreted or being treated clumsily by the destination HDMI product, okay? So leave it on until you have problems with that, and I doubt you will. So I'm menuing back, and we are certainly done with the HDMI third of three categories under the connection tile and guess what friends so here we are at the last and unfortunately system menus i have to admit they do tend to go on but then these are not as complex topics and open to less opinions from moi so all we have to do is just go through each of them and we're done all right so i'm pressing okay on this gear for the sort of potpourri trash can of all the last functions so clear settings couldn't be more obvious I'm not even going to show you what the submenu looks like because I'm too scared of getting rid of all my settings, but that's how you wipe the settings clean. Okay. So we've all seen that before format card. I'm also not, well, I'll go in there. I'm sure it's going to confirm. Yeah. And they're asking whether I want to erase my card. I currently do not, but that would erase again for sure. What's on your SD card, right? So it's a separate matter as to any connected SSD using the USB port. So there's that. Okay, this requires a little more complexity, and it's important for us to dive into each of these sub-menus to see the tools that are available to us, and hopefully we'll see most of them. When it comes to assist tools, display on is sort of like a, how do I say, it's almost like the FX mute button in Premiere. It's basically saying, you know what, guys, if I have any of these suckers below this top line activated, I can just globally turn them on or off. So here I can say, off to the whole kit and caboodle, right? So I say off. And what happened right now is that since I did by default and always like to have focus peaking with red medium accents activated, then um, it just turned it off when I did that, right? So that's cool. I'm gonna turn it back on, menu backwards. And then let's go next to actually not peaking is not is actually the third item. Let's go to scopes and let's see if we can get those showing up. So right now they're disabled. So I'm going to go to waveform. I like waveform. I actually don't like vector scope much because color is all about white balance to me. I don't like histogram at all. That's more for still photography. Um, 
Parade's kind of interesting. We'll do both, but um, waveform is really about luminance. So when I go to waveform, I've got it at the bottom left. There's that zero to a hundred range that represents um, really zero to two fifty five in the international standards ITU regulations. Um, if we were in that limited dynamic range of, of luminance, then we'd be within that. You know, again that. 15 to 255 i'm sorry to 235 range 16 to 235 range so there's my waveform so if i go down to parade what parade is is basically waveform but incorporates um the component of color in three separate waveforms and these are used for white balance purposes if the red the green and the blue are like at very different like elevations your goal is to sort of, I joke about how it's like drink two shots of whiskey, squint really hard, and then just sort of move them so they're not perfect, but they look generally like they're the same zone relative to each other. That literally is the definition of white balance, okay? So that's what people use parade for. But it's handy because in the same scope as you're doing the white balance, you can also go ahead and see whether you're blowing out your highlights and where and you can see how the dynamic range is being spread out and so on. So that's that parade. I mean, you know how this looks, but there's the vector scope. Um, what that's used for often is for the skin tone line, for example, at around 10.30 p.m. is the where I call that. Um, so you can see kind of where the glob of color is. But, you know, you can't isolate the skin tones with cropping on a camera. So these always have really limited value. That goes for histograms, too, which is, again, it's so still photography centric and it's just not something that cinema shooters use as much as waveform so i like waveform i actually don't have it activated very much because this will really lead us into talking about zebras later i think zebras are just simply a, a simpler way to deal with luminance than waveforms so there was that um opacity is as it as it sounds right you are measuring the uh, uh how much of the overlay is transparent so if i change this value you'll see it gets sort of disappears but as i kind of tick up you can see it slowly appearing so i mean i just i haven't been very positive during this video but it's another moment to say it's just really nice to see manufacturers like zcam do things that for the dumbed down consumer they would say oh if we had too many features they'll be confused but I think they, they, they acknowledge we're smart, and that's cool. All right, and then here, again, they acknowledge we're smart. You know, the, it, you know the, the nerd in the room could always nitpick and point out, well, wait a minute, if you're setting waveform values, you don't want to do it with the LUT baked in, but rather do it with the raw, you know, log footage. There is some value to that. Now, I'm the sort of um, color corrector who first religiously applies the official LUT onto flat log footage as a first step before I proceed to continue color correcting. And that really is the doctrinally right way to do it. But there are some people who like to apply custom LUTs that incorporate the Zcam characteristics of Zlog2, but do something else, right? So Ridley Scott or whatever, you know, different film looks. So for those types of people, you'd probably want to adjust waveforms, deal with all these things without the LUT applied. So that is the default setting, and it's probably a good place to be. But since I know that I don't tinker around too much more than the straight LUT conversion of the official Zlog2 LUT, I like to have it on with LUT. Feels like a better place for me to be. And you see how it suddenly changed very dramatically? I think it's a better way of judging exposure too, because again, your goal when you're dealing with waveform scopes is to look at where the brightest things are and whether they're clipping, whether they're sort of jamming up into darker lines at the top 100 line. And you wouldn't see that if it were in log mode because the whole point of Z log two is to pull the highlights down artificially only to bring them back up later on. I'm simulating that by saying with LUT. So with LUT is a good choice when you're in Zlog2 mode, in my opinion. So that was one scope. I'm going to go into scopes again, and I'm going to choose the next one. Uh, well, we've gone through all of these, haven't we? So I'm going to actually go ahead and disable um, the scopes so that our screen is clean. We're not distracted, right? So the waveform or anything else is disabled. But that still leaves a few more tools, doesn't it? 
So those were the scopes. But be, be, besides scopes, we have peaking. So peaking, everybody uses peaking, right? Is there any reason not to use peaking? I think not. Eh, what color you choose is also sort of a dumb choice. Um, does anybody not use red? I haven't met anybody who doesn't use red. But I guess if you want a green, you go ahead and use green, right? So we can see all the choices here. I think blue is a very bad choice. In fact, there's a reason why Star Wars was shot with blue screens, but it was one of the last movies that ILM used blue screens with because we all use green now. Why? Well, you can even see it in this image, right? That green is more stark and farther away from flesh tones than blue. So for even chroma keying purposes, that's how that evolved. So blue just doesn't stand out. It's not a good choice for peaking colors. Orange is fine. White's worse, right? Because that could easily be confused with sharp white images. So just use red, okay? <laughs> and then monochrome is another way to do peaking where the only thing that is colorful is the thing that's in focus, right? So it actually takes peaking up to another level. But um, my opinion is it's a little unnecessary because you sacrifice then the auditing of color that's necessary for a good cinematographer to do at all times. You're just trusting that the color is good. So I think it's good enough to just have the peaking on in color over color. And then when it comes to threshold value, I was a little disappointed by ZCam's implementation of this. I mean, at least they give us, again, they trust our intelligence and they give us a lot of fine tuning here, right? Most cameras just have low, medium, and high, including even black magic. But watch what happens when I go up even to a low value, the default with the camera, I think it defaults to 15. That already tells you that they start too low, or I think it's 20 actually. But we're already starting to lose the value of peaking. And so by the time we get up here, it's worthless, right? And even by the time we're at 50, it's really not doing its job as well as the low value. So guess what? See all the way down here at 10? I don't see any reason to not have it at the very, very lowest threshold value for peaking. So that's all about peaking. I leave it on all the time. And then again, it relies on, whoops, it relies on the display feature that's a global tools on or off. Down to exposure. We've got a few, well, we only, we have tool currently set to zebra and false color is one of those modes that again is very limited in use on an ongoing basis during a shot. Um, but it's a tool that some people like because it divides basically your shadows, highlights, and midtones into radical zones, doesn't it? As opposed to zebras that really focus on, you can see in the globe glare on the top right, it just limits itself to the question of zebra one setting and zebra two setting. So we have 100%. Um, that basically means that anything that is going to blow out because it's over 100 gets those animated hazard lines, right? We have a zebra setting zero, and then we can change that value um, to the extent that we want to see um, where the shadows are. I don't do that though, because shadows are lost or they're gained no matter what. I'm worried about highlights blowing out basically. But now let's stay in there because there were other tools, weren't there? There was monochrome. And so that's dealing with um, uh, things will be in color to the extent that they're blown, I think. So it, it, once again, it's dividing things like false color into zones that become eligible for color in this case, depending on whether they're um, the, the exposure values, right? So I find that to be the least value. So I leave it on zebras personally, and then I stay concerned solely with the um, hazards symbols on the 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 blown out highlights and then i let things blow out to the extent that i need to let things blow out in order to keep the foreground subject um at proper exposure finally to finish out my long explanation of all of this zebra stripes um uh are best set to a hundred and not worrying about skin tones because let me put it another way. Zebra stripes traditionally were set to about 70 or 65. And then what you do is you try to get the stripes to just barely show up on the subject, which is in the case of human subjects, skin tones. And then by doing so, you put priority on exposure to the subject. But when you're shooting in Z log two or any other good log format for that matter, 
you've probably seen the abbreviation ETTR, which stands for expose to the right. So when you expose to the right, what you're doing is you're creating a strategy for color grading and post-production that preserves the maximum dynamic range and latitude for you to basically scoot colors around. I'm sorry, to scoot luminance around. So what is wisest to do is to basically make things as bright as you can before blowing out unless you have to. And so for that reason, the only useful zebra metric is 100. Some people even go to 105 because they know they have a little extra room. Some people go to 95 to make sure that they have enough room. I just keep it simple and say 100, right? So I, I make sure that there's a little bit of blown out something in most of my shots. And then I let all the other stuff get lifted up. And then I know, though, that await, what awaits me in post-production, I'm going to have to do color correction anyways. So I might as, well, might as well have everything a little too bright and then uh, move things down from there and then adjust each uh, luminance value of highlights, midtones, and shadows independently of each other to get the exact look that I want. So that's my lecture on zebra stripes. We're almost there, and we're at frame line. And with frame line, um, that has to do with something I totally am not in the business of. I know a lot of people get, I don't know, they want to look very epic and Ben Hur like, and so they'll uh, create aspect ratios that are very Cinerama. So if you go 2.35 to 1, you get these little red lines that basically crops the top and bottom of the image. It helps you basically locate the action of the shot where you know it will survive after you pretend like you're creating an epic film and then you map the top and the bottom, right? So they have a few different variations on that. 1.85 to 1 um, is standard cinema aspect ratio in movie theaters. Um, 2.35 to 1 is what they call scope or cinema scope. That's the formal. And we have 4 to 3, which is, of course, television. And then none assumes whatever you're currently using. And in this case, it's 16 by nine, or actually it's, what is it? It's 1.85 to one, which is the aspect ratio of cinema 4k. So I'm going to menu back out. So I don't use frame lines. And then the color was the color of the frame line. You see, you have the choices between a few. So more fairly insignificant, useless stuff. We've reached almost the end of the assist tools, but now we have the center mark. And I always have mine on. You can see I have it on and that I also have it set to a certain color. I actually changed my mind. I'd rather just have a traditional white. And there we are, because then I don't get it confused at all with the color peaking, which is also the color red. So center mark helps me if I really do want to locate my Wes Anderson dead center for my shot. Um, it helps me while I'm panning so that I can see how it sort of like interacts uh, with the contour of a straight up and down line. So there's a lot of reasons why it's a great idea to have that. And then one more thing that's very sort of preachy is that I certainly am a big fan of the so-called rule of thirds. So you can see, uh, I always say to kids, it's like tic-tac-toe board, right? So if I press off, the tic-tac-toe board goes away. Ironically, I said kids, like most millennials and younger these days, they probably have never heard the term tic-tac-toe, so that's a whole other thing. But anyways, tic-tac-toe board... We use this to locate probably the pupils of interview subjects at the top left or top right junction of the lines. That's one thing we do. We also use them to like locate during a you know, conversation. We might have a two shot and then we might have a single and then a single and bounce back and forth between the two. So we try to locate the eyes at the junction point on the left cheating into the right or the right cheating into the left. So no, they're not rules. If you're Sam Esmail and creating Mr. Robot, um, if you're uh, Pavlovsky and you're creating Ida, yeah, you totally break these rules and locate things only on the bottom of the frame and so on. But for 90% of your shots, this rule of thirds is a great thing to honor and it's always great to have them on. And then to put it very simply, the main reason we use these is to have a level horizon, right? Because it's great to have that reference point to create a level horizon because even with a good tripod, we never quite get it until we have that on-screen guide. Okay, so there's grid line, safe area. That is really old fashioned, isn't it? That's all about like, you know, old Namjoon Paik style 
boob tube TV sets. Safe areas are typically traditionally used because of the fact that pre-digital television sets had that curve in the glass bulb. And so you really didn't want to have anything at the place where it curves and then meets the bezel. That's one of the reasons. The other reason is some people like it because it's like, well, maybe you should only have titles in that safe area as a sort of disciplinary tactic to make sure that you aren't stressing people out by having titles right at the edge of the screen. I get it. I never use it. You probably won't either. That's safe area. And with that, we're at the end of assist tools. And we're getting close to the end, but here's another really important thing that has less to do with tools on the viewfinder, but the whole viewfinder itself and how it represents the image. And quite simply, you'll see immediately what we're dealing with here when we go to none. And so when I, again, it's not a real time change, but as soon as I press okay over none, that's Z log two. So that's what Z log two actually looks like as opposed to what it looks like after it's converted, which is what this looks like, right? Rec 709 is the standard video delivery format, such as DVDs, Blu-rays, and quite frankly, on the internet, right? Um, these are somewhat fringe industrial variations on that that hardly any of us will ever, 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 ever use. Um, Rec 2020 is HDR. So let's say that, I mean, you can't even do this with Amazon Video Direct, but let's say you got some sweet contract to make a Amazon Prime 4K UHD film that's in true HDR, then you would be using Rec 2020 to represent the final output, right? So all of this stuff is a matter of previewing how things will look if you don't do anything more than just apply the standard LUT to convert back from log to video color space. So what you'll only end up using is either Rec 709 or not. That's the bottom line, okay? So that even goes for when you buy packages of the latest vloggers. I don't make money with my YouTube videos. I want to make money some other way. And so they make like, you know, the cinema pack, right? Those things, you could load them here using the custom icon, the import option you see down here. But that's always kind of a bad idea. The reason is, why would you want to preview on a preview monitor what your Z-Log2 footage will look like after you add your moody look to it. Your goal with a monitor is to get a fully accurate representation of how it looks in the real world. So there's no view besides the Rec. 709 conversion back to the real world that you would ever want to use for viewfinder purposes. And that's what this is really about. So it's always Rec. 709. I'm going to menu backwards. D squeeze display is something that my, I don't, I know I'm never going to buy an anamorphic lens in my life, but they're very trendy. So whether you are a, uh, who's that guy lens flares guy, I haven't forgot his name. He's making the next star Wars, right? And the, the first one of the last trilogy, JJ Abrams. I knew I was going to remember. So if you love lens flares, if you love anamorphic lenses, if you can live with one lens for an entire feature film, which makes you probably not very good, then sure, knock yourself out. And here's a way to use your one anamorphic lens and then find the match of whatever lens you're compromising your art with. So that's that. User profile is super handy. It's a way to save onto the SD card um, all of this stuff that we've carefully picked. And you have to be careful with this feature, though. I've got myself into a jam because if you format your SD card, um, because you're starting from scratch, you've already offloaded your footage, you backed it up and so on, you're going to lose this, right? So it's also a good idea to drag it off your SD card and name it appropriately, saying, you know, my favorite settings as of some date, right? So... This is all familiar interfaces. We've seen these on other cameras, even Sony DSLRs. User button. This is really important, isn't it? So um, I'm not going to go into this too much here because it really requires you physically looking at the camera, but I'll cut in a few views of all these different uh, buttons. And in a nutshell, there is a function button. Um, the function button is most useful on an ongoing basis. That's something that Zcam doesn't do a good job of explaining until you really dig hard. The FN button held at the same time as the OK button toggles the on-camera top screen between the menus we've been looking at in the top left and a live view, okay? So that's already just built in. We're not going to change that. 
But the FN button by itself, by default, is something that toggles on, and we're gonna see how that works right now. I'm gonna press it. And let's see, I'm gonna get out of the menus here first. I press that, and then you see at the top left, ISO just turn orange. I'm gonna press okay and do it again. I'm pressing it, three, two, one, press, ISO 800, right? And then I can turn up or down the value, right? So I can go from auto to up because I'm in Z log two, right? So I'm pressing the up and down arrows. And then when I'm done, I press okay, all right? So that's that. So I'm gonna go back to the menu so we can see that I had just pressed the FN button, which actually is physically labeled ISO on the actual chassis. And then just to the right of that, um, there is a button that um, says shutter and that's the up button. So when the up button is not you know, eligible because you're not in a menu at the moment. I'm going to go backwards. I press up, which is labeled with SHT for shutter. And then you can see that turn orange. So sure enough, I can change the value of the shutter up and down. I'm going to go back to my rule, press OK, and I'm there. I'll just finish this out. There's a one that's labeled EV for exposure value. So that's if you're an automatic shooter and if we're good cinematographers, we aren't. So I currently changed that to something else. So I currently changed it to change um, uh, the aperture value. So you can see that turned orange. And once again, I can go down or up. So I'm gonna leave it at F2.8 and press okay. So let's look more into this in the menu, right? I'm going into user button from system. I have my function button set to ISO. F1, F2, and F3 are on the front panel above the red power button. So starting from the top F1, this is the thing I mentioned earlier. I hope Zcam fixes this in a firmware update. It's actually my biggest request because otherwise they nailed it in every other way. But the white balance hotkey should be able to change between white balance modes if you're set to, let's say, incandescent it shouldn't require you to be in custom mode to be able to use the user button. That's my complaint. So currently, this actually isn't gonna do anything. You'll see, I'm gonna leave this and press my F1 button. And you, I'm pressing it repeatedly. It's not doing anything. And you can see it's fixed at 2800 Kelvin and it's grayed out. And the reason it's grayed out is because I identified incandescent light and it's set it there. So I have to be in custom mode to be able to use that hotkey. And sometimes I am, so I'm leaving it there. F2 is currently set to magnifier, and you'll see that in action when I press it. Punching in, and then I'm punching out again, right? So it doesn't record internally that punch in, but it does it for focusing purposes, right? And then I have F3 set to HDMI OSD, so watch. When I push it once, it made it go away for y'all. Press it again, gave it back to y'all. And actually, let's use that as an example of the choices you have. So you can see the whole list here, right? And I found, you know, I made my choice, you'll make yours. I certainly didn't want to assign an entire button to something like record when there already is a record button. Like, what were you thinking? So there's all those. I'm going to go backwards. And finally, power button, I left it at playback. It's a pretty wise choice because it's the only way to get to playback mode. So when I push the power button and don't hold it down, but once the power's on, if I tap it, I'm not gonna do it right now, but then it would go to um, playback mode and then I'd be able to watch you know, what I recorded. Um, so that's a feature that you might minimally use sometimes. So that's that one. OK button is um, also on the top panel, and um, by default, it's set to pull automatic focus. But once again, you, know, you can choose from all these other options. But like I said, the H2C ironically does make good use of autofocus with active lenses, given its form factor, the 4K resolution, and especially if you're using that tiny screen, you just can't pull focus using the tiny screen anyway. So you're really going to end up relying a lot on the autofocus feature. Uh, up button, uh, and we already talked about that because hard kind of written into the chassis is SHT for shutter. Down, hardwired written into the chassis for the down button is something that says EV exposure value, 
But since there was no button assigned for aperture, and we most cases have to man electronically control aperture on active lenses, I certainly wanted a hot button dedicated to that. So I have it set to the EV label, which is really set now to aperture. And we're cycled back to the beginning. So I'm menuing backwards and we've customized all the user buttons. Record indicator on, quite simply, there is a big red light on the front and the back. And so it's a great idea to have that on because it changes the atmosphere. But if you want it to be covert, then surely you can turn it off. Restore lens position. Um, that has something to do with when you disconnect an active lens and put it back on. I believe it's going to restore some values. It's the way it's behaved in the past. I couldn't get consistent results here and ascertain whether it was behaving one way or the other for this reason, but that must have something to do with that. I encourage you to experiment. Although I think a lot of Ecamm, uh, Zcam shooters are not even using active lenses. I do personally for image stabilization purposes more than anything. FYI, there's no sensor stabilization. So you're going to rely on um, in lens image stabilization, importantly so, because again, of the ergonomics of this camera, it's really hard to hold it steady. So LCD brightness means what it says. We're talking there, of course, about the little tiny window on the top of the camera chassis. And I leave it at 100 because you really do need that brightness in the field. And how much power consumption can there really be from that tiny of a screen? <coughs> Excuse me. And then we have power. This actually happened uh, during this uh, video when I was yammering too much. You can have it auto power off, which is an awesome feature to have. And you can certainly choose between whatever value you guess is appropriate. I set it at four minutes. Two minutes is just short enough when I'm kind of getting things set up when it turns off too quickly. Four minutes is just long enough so that, you know, I would always eventually be getting my way back to the camera within four minutes. You could go way up though, couldn't you? All right, so there's that. Auto standby. That is distinct from the other thing because this has to do with when you're um, network controlling or using a smartphone and that sort of thing. There's a difference between that, in other words, and completely shutting down the camera. So you can have it go into standby mode and yet it will still consume a little bit of the battery power instead of being a complete shut off. I would analogize this to the sleep mode um, in Windows or even a, I think Macs have this too, where you can put it to sleep, but it's still you know, poised and ready to go as soon as you press the power button, as opposed to when you go through a full shutdown sequence on your PC, and then you have to completely power up from scratch. And it can't be activated by a network connection, for example. And then low alarm, who wouldn't want this, right? But what this is doing is it's identifying the um, voltage value. Um, and the LP series battery means that it's looking at the voltage of a typical Canon um, uh, EL6 battery that hooks directly onto the back panel. And then the cool thing about this camera is that it doesn't expect only one value. It can, can directly receive a V-mount battery via its dedicated proprietary Limo style power port. And then from that port, it basically assesses the fact that V-mount batteries, once they get to 13.3 or lower, you're in danger zone of losing footage during a recording session. And then that the value of 5.8 volts is when you should start worrying with regards to an LPE6. One more caveat. Like I said, this happened during this recording, and right now I'm at 7 volts. But the implicit problem of Canon batteries this small, especially well-known to BMPC, Blackmagic Pocket 4K users, is that it goes off to a cliff at a certain point. So this is a bad way to get a warning about battery life because these numbers are totally unreliable, not only because of the battery type, but as between um, native OEM manufacturers versus third parties like Watson, my favorite battery of choice, they will behave differently and it makes this a bad metric to go by. So maybe the answer to this is I'm going to tick up a little bit, be a little more conservative so you get the warning a little earlier rather than later. So that's, I think I'm how I'm going to manage this. It's funny how that interface works. You tick up, and I think you have to press function to move to the next item in this case and press OK. Rare case of that. All right. So that was the low alarm. So I've pressed menu to go backwards, and we have language, Chinese or English. 
We have date and time. We have time zone. I'm in Washington, D.C., so I'm negative 5. We have camera status, where it tells us how much room there is on the internal SD card. It tells us the temperature. It tells us the firmware. It tells us the serial number. I don't care if you see it. <laughs> and then uh, it tells us the total space, available space, and how much is being used. So super handy that way. So I'm going to menu backwards. Oh my gosh. I press it down and I can see the firmware version at a glance, even though I could also see that in the camera status submenu. Have we arrived at the end? I believe we have. Thanks for hanging with me. We have made it all the way through every friggin' menu item in this whole product. I'm going to label this whole tutorial as being mostly relevant to the E2 and even the flagships. That will get me into some trouble if anybody cares or even bothers making their way to this point. But it really is true that the great thing about Zcam's approach is to make the menus very familiar. So if you go from one Zcam to the next, everything will look familiar. And by going through every single feature here, I've pretty much prepared you for the other Zcam camera products, probably even going forward into the future. And then there will be a few extra bells and whistles proprietary to each particular camera. But we've learned the whole damn thing. Um, I'm going to take a dive real quick into the smartphone menus just to show you how that looks, and then we'll be able to wrap up. Now you're looking at a view of the Android control app by Zcam which is sort of in beta, but it essentially will look the same as the iTunes version that you can get for iPads and iPhones. And the way I have it connected right now is via Wi-Fi to the E2C. The reason I had to do that is because the USB-C cable is currently occupied to send HDMI out to the Shogun, which is what you're watching now. So assume for the sake of argument, I've gone through the step of connecting via Wi-Fi from my smartphone over to the E2C. And when presented with the screen, when I tap live control, that'll let me go straight to the shot we saw before. So things have changed a little bit because we're sort of starting from scratch. It has its own independent settings in terms of how it looks when we watch it. But you can see some circles on the bottom of the screen. And already we can tell that that's going to be a faster and more direct touch oriented way to control parameters. So this is a lot faster than hitting hard keys on the chassis and looking into that tiny window on the top of the unit. The image looks very flat because we haven't applied any LUT. So you can see on the bottom right of the row of circles that there's a LUT button. You won't be able to see my fingers pushing down on the touchscreen, but you'll see a quick glimmer when I activate LUT. And you can see it toggled on the appropriate Rec. 709 LUT. So things are starting to look more normal. But the most killer feature of this, something that Sony, by the way, resisted for years stubbornly with their stupid Play Memories app and whatever they call it now, I think it's called Imaging Edge, is their patent refusal to allow the most important feature of any such app like this to work, which is to focus, right? So one of the great things about a touch screen is that you can just touch on the screen and then say, I want that in focus. So I'm gonna touch the Blu-ray case. And it just took one tap and you can see that it was very happy to do so. So it's almost like changing the focus range. I have it in autofocus mode, but not continuous autofocus mode. And as a result, I was able to just tap where the focus range should be. You could see that the box was of a certain size and we had specified that in the menus. I want the globe to be in focus now, so I'm gonna press that. And it didn't work, so let's try it again. You can see it's trying, but it didn't quite get it, did it? Because overlapping was a bit of the image. So we have the size of the focus area needing to kind of really encompass everything. So again, we see the limitations of contrast detection autofocus, but it does its job good enough, right? because it's really easy to go back and forth. The other issue going on here too is that do you see how it hunts forward and backward a little bit? So this is simply not going to work mid-shot. It's gonna be something that you'll wanna use um, over uh, before and after you um, press start. So no need to go through every single option, but you can see how easy it is to go to specific things like this is the settings menu. But when we go there, you can see that it pulls, uh, it creates a sort of inset where we can very quickly go and scroll through using our, again, this is a touchscreen interface. So 
you can see a lot more on screen at once. And that sort of settings icon, again, you can see it right there, it flashed red, gives us quite a lot of options, including a lot of these sub options that we were digging into, right? So it's almost like that's a sort of master control, but if I tap it again to leave, and I accidentally pulled focus, didn't I? You can see how finicky it is. It still doesn't want it, does it? It's getting there. There it comes, but not quite. Pulling it again, and there it finally got it. So surely limited. But you can go directly to certain functions. So indeed, I have the LUTs, but I also have things like ISO. So I can just pull that, pull that up, and instead of all of the kind of uh, deep menus on the right side, it has a really nice, big, easy-to-see menu where I can just tap, for instance, 1250. Same goes for Iris. I can darken it a little more to compensate. And then there are certain things even ghosted out like exposure value since I don't have it on automatic. You can even pull up scopes, can't you? You can turn on and off, toggle through basically the zebras, false color, peaking, and so on, toggling through the scopes. And then very importantly, once I've once again struggled to find focus, I can initiate record. So this is recording, of course, into the camera onto an SD card, but when I tap this, sure enough, there it goes. By initiating record, by the way, the E2C does its best to pull focus, and then you can see how magnificently it's doing so right now. So, But at least we have this interesting remote control option, and the range on this is pretty spectacular because given the fact that there's a pivoting whip antenna built into the chassis that extends the range, you really can remotely control from across, let's say, an auditorium, um, one of these cameras from one location where you might have your A camera, let's say. So this remote control feature is just spectacular. You can also change the orientation, and then it gives you a different view. Of course, for this aspect ratio, it was, um, you could see quite a lot of cropping, but you can see the value of this, right? Because if you want to hold your smartphone that way, it still reveals plenty of controls, but gives you that more portrait orientation. So I'm going to bounce back. And that pretty much covers it, right? Because now we can see the more direct way to access the menus. There's a part of me that still prefers physically touching the buttons and going into the menus because there's some buggy qualities to this interface, but um, the latency is pretty minimal. And again, it's hard for me to demonstrate the, that to you this way, but I can say that it's less than a second off for sure and performs much better than, for example, the live view of all of the Sony Alpha series uh, products. So it's a very viable option for literally, you know, treating your smartphone or tablet as a true viewfinder, especially when you directly tether it via a hard cable like USB-C. So where are we now? Well, after taking such a very long deep dive into every single menu item and then shooting some test footage in the field, Let's finish this out by rigging up the product. And I do have some comments on that after spending a couple of months accessorizing it. When it comes to audio, it was just this past week that Rode delivered what turns out to be the perfect pairing with the E2C, and that's their new VideoMic NTG. It's a great bargain. At $250, it's actually their NTG5, a higher-end boom microphone but it adds some features like a built-in lithium battery and a USB-C port for connection to computers as an option. You're seeing it in a hot shoe interface that in turn adapts onto a NATO rail, which is a great way to accessorize your camera in a sort of quick release manner. And then that's tied down to the small rig E2C cage, which is the perfect companion for the E2C. And you see an eighth inch stereo cable going into the mic port. Another really important thing we need to rig up is a way to actually see what the camera's shooting. That tiny little viewfinder that's the menu screen um, can get us by in a pinch, but to pull critical focus and so on, we need something as big as this. At 7 inches, the best view R7 is what I think pair pairs perfectly with the E2C. It's affordable. It has 1,000 nits of brightness. You can see a lot of um, uh, redundant overlays right now, but um, you have your choice of using one or the other. 
there's an HDMI cable coming out to um, something that locks it down to the E2C's small rig cage that comes with the cage. But what you'll probably use most of the time is a smartphone or tablet mounted on one of these really cheap adapters that connects onto the quarter inch 20 screw. And that gives you a touchscreen interface that we've seen works best in our menu guide. Another way to use that quick release NATO rail is to connect a handle. And we all have one of these. It doesn't have to be this one, but anything that's NATO rail compatible gives us another option to quickly move the camera around, to undersling it in handheld mode, and just add that extra layer of protection. My last recommendation is this new product by Zacuto called the Zarn. And when you do go handheld, it's just a great and ultra portable way to stabilize the camera. So hey, thanks for making it to the end with me. In tandem with making this video, I've also created a user group community for Zcam users where you can share your own work and find the latest news about these products. So please join at the links you see on the screen under the line, and I'll see you there.